This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. My name is Christine Graham Mullen and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken as normal. I will now take a roll call. Board members, as you hear your name called, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then please place yourself back on mute. Michael Burt Whistle. I'm here. Maria, ciao. Here. Jack Jemsick. Here. Doug Marshall. Here. Janet McGowan. Here. Thank you. Board members, if technical difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily to rectify the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let Sean or Pam know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if a disconnection has occurred. Please use the raise hand function to answer a question or to make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call upon you to speak. After speaking, please try to remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and at other times throughout the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. If you do wish to make a comment during the any of the public comment periods, you must join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide and can be entered into a search engine. The link can also be found on the um, on the meeting agenda, which is located on the town website in two ways. One is through the calendar listing for this meeting on the homepage, and you can find a link within the event details. A second way is to go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda link. On the agenda, there is a link towards the top of the page where it states virtual meeting. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when the public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called upon, please identify yourself stating your full name and address and put yourself back in mute when finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If these guidelines are not um, complied with or the speaker exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Included on tonight's agenda, item three, public hearing, site plan review. The board will continue the public hearing for Amherst Media's SPR application to construct a new home office building, which is being continued from July 15th. Additionally, the board will uh, open a public hearing for uh, SPP 2021-01 submitted by Amherst Media to request a front setback modification requirement. The SPP and SPR public hearings will be combined as a joint public hearing for the purpose of discussion. Moving on, the slide will now show the meeting agenda. Again, note the virtual Zoom meeting link. Uh, we will now move on to uh, item one, which is minutes, and we actually have two sets of minutes to review. Let's see here. So I have, uh, we have June 3rd. Uh, minutes from that and June 17th. Um, we'll start with June 3rd and I'm watching for any hands. Are there any comments or additions that anyone would like to make? Uh, Chris, I see your hand first. Chris? Um, so um, Janet McGowan sent me some uh, comments about the June 3rd meeting. I can read them to you now if you're sure. ready for that. Um, so on page 11, Paragraph four in the second sentence, um, Ms. McGowan would like it to read, Ms. McGowan expressed concern that the proposed process does not provide notification to abutters, neighbors, or nearby businesses. And that seems fine to me. So that's item one. Item two is on page 12, at the very top of the page. The first paragraph, um, Ms. McGowan added, she asked about voting requirements on the planner's listserv. 
other towns with a supermajority voting requirement reported that it was not usually a problem, but at times it can be a problem to have a quorum. So meetings were rescheduled for a vote. And that seems fine to me too, in terms of content. Okay, thank you, Chris. Are there, I'm um, watching for hands. Are there any other members who have comments to the June 3rd minutes? And if I am not seeing any hands, um, I could also take a motion. Uh, Michael. There we go. Uh, I move to approve the motion, uh, the, the minutes as uh, uh, suggested amendments by Ms. Bessler. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, uh, any other discussion on these June 3rd minutes? I'm not seeing any uh, hands. I still, uh, Michael, yours is still up, but um, so at this point we can take a vote. I'll do a quick roll call. Um, of course, I've lost that sheet already. <laughs> All right, so um, for the June 3rd minutes to uh, accept them with the uh, changes, Michael Burtwistle? Yes. Maria? Yep. Jack? Yes. Doug? Yes. Janet? Yes. And myself, Christine? Yes. So that's six zero zero. So if we move to the next one, uh, June 17th, again, I'm watching hands. Does anyone have any comments or additions they would um, like to make on the June 17th? Uh, Doug? Yeah, one brief, brief uh, minor edit on page 11. The first uh, paragraph under board comments and discussion. Uh, second line. Uh, the, the line, I would like it to read, uh, band on the facade that separates the stone and the siding so that it aligns with the second, the first floor level. Ah, uh, I'm, uh, yep. And where is that? You said page 11? Page 13, page 13, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, Good. Thank you. Can you read that again, please? So that it aligns with the first floor level. Thank you. Is that all, Doug? Yes. I'm not seeing any other hands. I could also take a motion. Anyone, uh, Michael? I move, I move to approve the, oh, sorry. Move to approve the motion, uh, the minutes as uh, amended. Uh, I second. Will, I will second. Okay, great. Any other comments, uh, concerns? I'm watching for hands. Um, I'm going to lower Michael's ears. Um, so I see no hands. So at this point, uh, we'll take a quick roll call. So to approve the June 17th minutes as amended, uh, Michael? Uh, yes. Maria? Yes. Jack? Yes. Doug? Hi. <laughs> Janet? Yes. And myself. So that's six zero zero approved. Great. And thank you both Chris and Pam for doing these. They're both very long and um, detailed. Thank you. Okay, so we will move to item three. Item three, public comment period. So this is, um, Pam, if you can start looking. This is a time where um, attendees can address the board for something that's not on our agenda for tonight, something different um, that they wanna to bring to us attention. And just remember that we don't give a response back, but we will listen. Uh, Pam, do we see anybody in there with a uh, raised hand? I'm not seeing any. I, I don't see any raised hands and we have um, nobody who has called in at this point. Okay, great. So. So at this point, I see no public comment. We'll move on. What time is it? Yep, 6.41. So we can definitely start our public hearing. Okay. So. I'm gonna move Mr. Sparkle in. Okay, great. Let me see. All right, I'll start. 
Okay, so it is 641 in accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 40. This public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2020-11, Amherst Community Television, DBA, Amherst Media, corner of Gray Street and Main Street, continued from July 1st and July 15th, 2020. Request site plan review approval to construct a new building and associated site improvements for Amherst Media, a 501c3 educational institution under section 3.330.0 of the zoning bylaw, BN zoning district, map 14B, parcels 250 and 251. Same time, I'm also going to open um, a special permit, SPP. So um, now it is um, both of these were um, combined and advertised at the same time. So now at 642, in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 48, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted. This hearing is being held for the purpose of providing an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPP 2021-01 Amherst Community Television, DBA, Amherst Media, corner of Gray Street and Main Street. Request a special permit under footnote A of Table 3, Article 6 of the Zoning Bylaw to modify the front setback requirement, if required, for a new building for Amherst Media, BN Zoning District, Map 14B, Parcels 250 and 251. So, with them both combined, uh, first thing I'm going, I'm watching for hands. Uh, are there any board disclo uh, board member disclosures? Um, and I'm not seeing any, but I'll continue to watch. Uh, welcome, welcome, Mr. Sparkle. I see Hello. you there. Good evening. You have different things hanging behind you now. I try to keep it interesting. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, is there anyone else that you need here or you expect that uh, will also be presenting or talking? Um, I did send a list to Pam. I'm expecting that Jim Lesko, the executive director of Am Amherst Media, would be available. There may be other members of the board uh, with him. Um, I also know that due to the power outage, a couple people who would normally be here are not able to be here tonight. Hmm. Uh, but I don't think we're worried about it at this time. Okay. Oh. Um, Bucky, do you want me to move Jim Lesko in as a panelist now? Do you want me to wait until you tell me to? How um, do you want that to work? If, if you're able, please bring him in at this point, okay. and I'm sure Jim will use restraint <laughs> and yep. uh, speak up if, if he feels it's it's pertinent. You know, he, he is my boss after all on this. Okay, I'll move him. Let's move him in, and I can tell I can tell you who else is over here. Um, Ed Severance. Oh, Ed made it great. Sure. Would you like him to come on into? Yes, please. Um, and I believe that is it, unless somebody is is logged in with a different name. Um, and if they are, they can raise their hand and let me know. I'll be watching. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, so do you want to share your screen yeah. or, okay. Let me get this rolling. And give us a heads up if there's anything we need to pull out of our packet um, to look at. I don't think so. Um, my The presentation is not uh, extremely long. In fact, I'll probably spend more time reading things on my screen than extemporaneously going off on tangents here. So um, let me let me just get into it here. Um, uh, again, I'm Bucky, representing Amherst Media, and Gillen Collaborative Architects is also around uh, sometimes, maybe not tonight, to uh, support this process and was the designer for the building. Um, first, uh, since this is a joint meeting, I want to focus on the site plan review. This is my only slide for the site plan. Um, from the continuation from two weeks ago, there were a few requests that the board made. There was lots of discussion, but just a few requests. Um, one, they wanted to see the parking management plan as a separate document that was separated and submitted um, with a very minor edit, basically that there was also the request for two spaces to be labeled as guest parking. And those spaces are number seven and eight. And those are the two that are on the east side against Gray Street. So we'll have guest parking signs for those two spaces. 
and there was a question about whether or not the roof was solar ready. And yes, indeed, it is designed to be solar ready. Um, and as far as I know, that was everything that came out of that meeting that required a response from me. Um, uh, today, I did get a copy of a letter from uh, Attorney Matt Massengill, um, which I just want to bring up. Um, it, he mentioned uh, propane trucks and fueling uh, in that letter that he wrote, and maybe you've had a chance to read it or not, but I just want to point out that there are no propane tanks on the site and that his hypothetical concern regarding what would happen if a truck showed up to fuel um, is not a concern because there's nothing to fill. Um, there is no propane tank. No. Okay. Yes. Uh, and, um, and really that wraps up the, the site plan review portion of my presentation tonight, because really what's new on the table is the special permit that has been um, in much discussion. So moving into that, um, uh, yes, Amherst Media is absolutely a 501c3 educational nonprofit uh, use functionality institution, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and bylaw 6.60 does say that educational or religious uses shall have the minimum front, side, rear setbacks of twice the distance shown in table three, which is the dimensional regulations in article six. Um, normally these, the front setback would be <clears throat> 10 feet. Um, and if bylaw 6.60 were enforced to this application, then that would be 20 feet, which as, as previously discussed would be problematic for the current layout um, and go contrary to what the local historic district commission was hoping to achieve. Um, however, of course, I think we all know that footnote A of table three says that the setbacks can be modified under a special permit um, by the special permit granting authority, which in this case is the planning board. So that's what we're doing here today, hopefully. Um, so we are requesting a reduction in that setback requirement such that the building may sit where proposed. Uh, and to look at that, uh, the familiar side of the site plan, I'll zoom in a little bit just to the front of the building because that's really what is sort of the hot topic here. So presently, the building sits at closest 13.3 feet from the front setback to Main Street. Um, some of it sits back almost 26 feet, actually the majority of the building, and this is over 31 feet from the front lot line over on the east side. Um, so just to give people a sense of what we're talking about for this site specifically. Um, but you know, when we're looking at these things, it's it's in relationship to the neighborhood, as I'll as I'll bring up a few times here. Um, so in one case, we have um, location. Okay, so the the local historic district commission also did write a letter of support, which I've brought up a few times over the last few meetings. And one of the sentences in that uh, I say report, it was really a, a letter. I think I said report, but it was a letter, and it said that um, the location on the site, the massing of the proposed building, were very important considerations for the commission because these attributes make the structure consistent with the character of the historic district. So uh, we have already located things according to the historic district commission uh, in an optimal manner uh, regarding placement on the property. Um, and looking relative to the neighborhood and a larger scale, not just our site, um, what I've done is I prepared a little sketch based off of uh, the town of Amherst GIS system, which shows buildings across the street um, on Main Street uh, in the historic district. Well, most of them are. And the front setbacks are nine feet, nine feet. That's also nine feet, but it's really the same building. This one's 15 feet. That's the biggest of them. And this one is negative two feet, which means it's actually encroaching into the public right of way. And on average, these buildings are 7.75 feet from the front property line. And Amherst Media is proposing 13.3 feet. So almost twice what the um, average is in the area and almost as large as the largest setback in the, the one block area of commercial district. So we are um, a little more generous in our setback as proposed than is you know sort of experienced in the neighborhood um, currently. So that's how we sit relative to the neighborhood. Um, but then also in comparing the use, the educational use uh, of 
Amherst Media, like, yes, it is uh, an educational uh, facility, but it's much more like a tutoring facility. Uh, for example, there is not a classroom in this building. Um, and most educational facilities uh, would, would definitely have classrooms. Uh, so it's not a typical educational use. Um, you know, if you're talking about UMass or a high school or uh, Amherst College, you know, these buildings are offered an imposing, fairly, fairly large structures. Uh, simultaneously, sometimes they can have hundreds of visitors in, in large classrooms or scores of visitors in multiple classrooms. Uh, and normally, uh, the properties of, of these institutions you know, have, have ample room. They, they have a little more wiggle room uh, than Amherst Media has. And looking at the proposal uh, that I'm presenting tonight, you know, it's a fairly unassertive building. It has been designed in residential scale with the buildings on Gray Street and have a, a, a diminutive commercial feel smaller than some of the buildings uh, across the street that are commercial buildings, uh, only getting a handful of visitors at a time, quite literally, like no more than five usually on uh, people in this building at a time. And it's a very modest lot area. It's, it's only uh, just over a half acre. Um, so you know, we don't quite fit the, the typical uh, educational facility, which uh, you know, makes sense. If you have a, a giant building with a uh, you know, 15,000 foot footprint and uh, you know, several stories tall, you know, ha doubling the setback makes an awful lot of sense in that case. It does not make sense in the case of Amherst Media. Um, and that ties into what some of the town's experts have said. Uh, the co building commissioner wrote in a determination uh, last month, uh, quote, in my opinion, section 6.6 .6 of the zoning bylaw does not apply and the additional setback is not required. And the town attorney uh, backed that up just a few days ago saying, I interpret the building commissioner's determination to be finding that it would not be a reasonable regulation to apply section 6.60 to this project given the site, the proposed use, and the foreseeable impacts, and so on. In my opinion, this determination is when within the building commissioner's discretion. So in, in some ways, if, if we just listen to what the experts said, the special permit isn't even necessary, um, that it, we're sort of doing a belt and suspenders approach with the additional special permit process, uh, because we just want to make sure that we cover all the possible bases that we can uh, for this overall project to move forward as proposed and designed in conjunction with the Local Historic District Commission. Um, looking at uh, the bylaw a little bit, uh, under uh, bylaw 1038, specific findings required for special permits. Um, there are 19 items, this proposal uh, does comply with all of them. And I do wanna point out a couple. And the first one is 10.391, um, which indicates that the proposal should protect the historic features in the area and the entire site design the shape size mass of the building have all been very finely tuned through the seven meeting process with the historic district commission um, it that the whole design is predicated upon protecting the historic features of this neighborhood um, obviously we, we're not blocking the important views on the west side of the lot the building has been brought down and the uh, architecture is in line with what would be expected for the Emily Dickinson Historic District. Going a little further uh, into both uh, sort of the finding section and table three, bringing these ideas together uh, and with the findings 10.395 uh, says that the pro proposal should not create disharmony with respect to the train and the use scale and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity which have functional or visual relationship there too. And I bring this one up because footnote A brings this one up and it says in applying the criteria established in section 10.395, the special permit granting authority shall consider the proposed modified dimensional requirements in the context and patterns of that same, <laughs> and I've got my screen blocked off with all your faces here, I gotta move that. Um, um, in the context and patterns of the same dimensions established by existing buildings uh, in the surrounding neighborhood. So. I've already shown that uh, we are more generous in the setback and uh, doubling the setback uh, is, would be significantly out of step with the existing surrounds, which really 
um, then sort of brings me to the, the end of this brief portion here. You know, just I surely do not need to remind the board and purpose of special permits um, is you know, to ensure a harmonious relationship between the proposed development and the surroundings. Um, and that, is, of course, is consistent with the purpose and intent of the bylaw, um, which certainly we don't have to get into. Uh, so I, I do want to say that the proposal, the building, the location, the scale, the massing is harmoniously integrated with the surroundings. It's already been assured by the local historic district commission's review, uh, as well as protecting the historic interests of the district and that the educational use of Amherst Media is nothing like the use and functionality of um, the middle school or, or, or UMass or Amherst uh, College buildings. Um, so this is the reason that we are uh, requesting a special permit per footnote A of table three for this project as we have offered it. And that concludes my presentation to the board and I'm happy to open the discussion now. Thank you. Thank you. And is there um, anyone else from Amherst Media who wants to speak at this time? I don't see any hands. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you for that information. Yeah. At this time, um, and if you don't mind just leaving your screen up in case uh, one of the board members has a question on one of the slides. Sure. So I'll open it up to the board members right now. Uh, does anyone have questions on this new information? Um, can also be Chris, uh, questions to Chris Bestra regarding the special permit um, and any uh, administrative or internal questions. I see uh, Jack Jemsek's hand. I was just wondering about the argument with the propane uh, tank um, submitted by the abutters, one of the abutters representative there. How, um, was there some confusion? I, I'm just trying to recall, was there some confusion in terms of the initial submittal referencing propane deliveries or where did that come from? I guess is my question. Um, I am not sure where that came from. Our plan has never shown a propane tank. In fact, the plan has always shown the uh, the mystical gas connection. So we've we've always indicated that if it's available, we might make a gas connection. And the uh, architects have been working with mechanicals that could potentially work off of a gas system if it were available. But nobody on our end of the table is really interested in a propane tank. I think it has been discussed at the meeting somehow uh, extemporaneously, and I, I can't put my finger in my memory as to how that came up. But uh, it's it's. We're not interested. We don't have room for it. We don't have it on the plans. Never have. So how is the building being heated? Electricity. Okay. Okay. Are there any other um, board questions at this time? I'm not seeing any hands. Um, if not, we could move on to um, move on to the public comment. So at this time, I'll ask uh, an, attendees. I don't think we have too many, but um, if I could see a show of hands in our attendees, who would like to speak um, tonight? I'm just watching just to see. I'm seeing one hand. Okay, so I see one hand. Uh, Pam, I'm sure you see that. So okay. I'm gonna let's do it. Do we have any calls? Just, just at this. I'm not call. seeing any calls. So I, I just see the one, the one hand, Attorney Finnegan. Okay. Well, I'll recognize Mr. Finnegan. Uh, I think he's still muted. So you can you hear me now? We can. Welcome. If you could introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel Finnegan. I'm an attorney and I represent the Abutter Harms by LLC. Um, just, just very, very briefly, I just want to make a couple of comments. One, I just want to point out that the, uh, that the setback requirement can't be complied with is just further evidence that the project, as we've stated before, just appears to us to be 
too large for um, the lot on which is proposed to be situated. So I'd just like to make that comment again for the record. And then also for the record, I'd just like to note that um, we disagree that the appropriate mechanism to vary that setback requirement is a special permit in front of the planning board. And again, I just make that comment for the record. That's all. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any other hands? I'm not seeing any other hands. So um, I'm gonna close the public comment. Pam, still no phone calls or anything. So this, nope. okay. So this would be closing public comment for both the site plan review and the special permit. Um, going back to the panelists, um, I'm going to ask, are there any other questions? Okay, I see a couple of hands popping up. Michael, and then I see Jack. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Finnegan uh, to explain why he finds the uh, setback uh, uh, inappropriate. Uh, is he still? Um, okay, he's I, I, I just unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, the question was why I find it inappropriate? Yes. The setback? Well, as, as I say, the fact that the building is this uh, close uh, and the issues we've stated with the parking lot, the whole project just appears to us to be too large for the, um, for the space in which it's proposed to be located. Um, we, we feel that the setback requirement is there in the bylaw for a good reason. They can't be an educational use when it benefits them under the bylaw, but not an educational use when it doesn't benefit them. They're an educational use. They should be required to comply with the setback in the bylaw, which in this case is 20 feet. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna mute you. Thank you. Um, going back, uh, Michael, is that all? Or should I, can I move to Jack? Oop, you're muted, Michael. Oops, let me unmute you. Try again. Uh, it's fine. I'm. I'm. Uh, my question is answered. Thank you. Great. All right, Jack. Yes. Uh, whoops. Uh, I'm just. I'm just thinking that there's. There's a. Uh, in terms of uh, the quote-unquote record, I was wondering if maybe. Uh, uh, Chris Brestrup could summarize all the supportive information um, from the town council, from Rob Mora, um, and then there's the the you know attorney letter from uh, is it My, what Miles Lipton or uh, something like that. But there's 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 a um, um, kind of a significant argument how this is all okay. And I just, if I know Bucky, or maybe Bucky could just, you know, retort that, that yeah, sorry. I, I, I don't, we don't need Chris to, <laughs> to, to it's, I'm happy it's to do it. I'm happy to let okay. Chris, Chris go as well. She's, you know, obviously she's always uh, um, in acting in the interest of the town um, and I'm just the hired gun, but I'm, I'm happy to summarize. Um, so we do have, uh, a letter, uh, an email from Rob Mora that says because uh, the the real the functionality of the educational use is is not so typical that section six point six zero would not apply, and then the town's attorney Joel Bard uh, indicated that the building commissioner's opinion uh, is defensible. And it's his, I guess, right to, to make that kind of determination in this case. Um, and you mentioned a letter from attorney Michael Pill, who has represented uh, pro bono Amherst Media. And that, that letter, while is it, it is not in my mind quite as clearly, that was in response to, um, how did that come out? So there, there was another letter. Oh, there was a letter um, written to the, I believe it was a planning board. It was, there was already an appeal filed for, I think this very meeting before the meeting even happened. Um, and Michael Pill, uh, and this is where really, really we should be having a lawyer describe this, but my understanding of that letter was that was out of order. Um, and that the 
indication that an, an appeal being filed prior to a meeting ever happening uh, was in an appropriate situation. Uh, so I think that's where Michael Pill, and he's from Green Miles and Lipton, that other attorney organization. And I, I very much encourage and would appreciate uh, if Chris Brestrup also either verified what I'm saying or added something if I didn't quite hit the nail on the head. Yes, I, I would. Chris, could you give us a little bit of what, you know, in-house town hall and with the uh, our legal counsel? So um, am I muted or I'm unmuted? No, so we hear you. Yep. The, the um, Butters have filed uh, an appeal with the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, and they are appealing the advisory opinion of the um, building commissioner. And the advisory opinion of the building commissioner was that um, the front setback issue can be dealt with the, uh, with regard to um, a special permit for modification of the front setback. Um, the building commissioner also uh, had the opinion that um, section 6.6 .6 didn't apply in this case. Um, so the, uh, I think I had sent you a copy of the appeal um, that the abutters filed. If not, I apologize for that. But the, the thrust of Mr. Pill's letter is really um, against the appeal that is coming before the Zoning Board of Appeals and isn't necessarily, you know, um, speaking about uh, the, th the things that you are considering other than to support the idea that a special permit, um, if, if section 6.6 .6 applies, that a special permit um, could, be, um, could be filed. I think he said that, but I'm not sure. Let me see. Actually, he didn't even refer to the special permit um, that you are considering. He really uh, has his arguments against the applicant or the abutters um, filing of the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, appeal of the decision of the building commissioner. So it's really outside of your realm of jurisdiction, but I wanted you to see it anyway, just so that you, um, you know, have all the facts. So the building commissioner essentially said that this building isn't really in terms of its um, practical function. Um, it doesn't really operate like a, um, an educational institution or um, like UMass buildings or Amherst College buildings. And he gave me the example of um, some of our um, group homes here in Amherst. And the group homes uh, come in under the, um, under the use category of nonprofit educational institutions. And these group homes are usually for um, older adults who can't function on their own and need a s sort of protective environment. Um, and we never require, um, it never even comes up to require a doubling of the setback for group homes, because even though they are um, considered under 501c3, they really operate more like a home. Um, so the uh, effect on the neighborhood, the impact on the neighborhood, the traffic, the number of people coming in and out, the height of the building, et cetera, isn't really similar to um, other educational institutions. So that's an example of a case where something comes in under um, the nonprofit educational institution use category, but is not required to comply with section 6.6. .6. Um, the other thing that um, Jill Bard pointed out is that the Dover Amendment, which um, governs these nonprofit educational and, and religious institutions, um, says that municipalities may apply reasonable regulations. And so there's a, you know, differing opinions about what reasonable regulations um, are. But in this case, the building commissioner has um, made uh, a discretionary determination that um, the reasonable regulation in this case does not require that there be a doubling of the front setback given the impact that this building will have on its surroundings. And so you can find out more about that by reading um, Joel Bard's email of August 2nd, which I have forwarded to you. But I, I could, um, I interpret the building commissioner's determination to be a finding that it would not be, quote, a reasonable regulation to apply section 6.6 .6 to this project, given the site, the proposed use, the foreseeable impacts, and so on. But um, Joel Bard goes on to say that even, even if you find that 
six, section 6.6 6 does apply in this case, um, you can still uh, consider the application for the special permit under footnote A and grant that, um, and that he would consider that um, a, good, a good thing to do. So one of the things you need to do in this case is you need to make a finding as to whether you think section 6.6 6 applies or not. And then um, after that, you need to uh, determine whether you want to grant this special permit. And in the case, if you thought that section 6.6 6 applied, then granting the special permit would be a confirmation that you um, agree that section, that um, the doubling of the, that, that, excuse me, that you will grant a modification of the setback under footnote A. If you think it doesn't apply, then it's not absolutely necessary that you grant the special permit, but we would recommend that you do nonetheless as a kind of belt and suspenders. So in any case, we think that you should, um, we, we, our recommendation would be to grant the special permit um, and then um, prior to that also make a finding about whether you think section 6.6 .6 applies or not. Does that help? That does help. So um, should we do that now and discuss as members whether we find if it does apply to 6.6 .6 regarding the special permit and um, that we should go forward with this process of a special permit. So I'm gonna call some hands. I see, I, I'm gonna call on Doug and then Janet and then I see Michael. So Doug. Yeah, I just wanted to let Chris uh, tell us whether uh, in reference to uh, Attorney Finnegan's assertion that the planning board is not the right authority to uh, grant a waiver of a setback requirement, whether there are any other boards that are so empowered. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent question. Chris, can you pop back on? So um, ordinarily, or in many cases, the Zoning Board of Appeals is the special permit granting authority. Um, they're usually listed as the special permit granting authority in the use table. In this case, um, the building commissioner has made a practice of um, having um, dimensional modifications go to whatever board is um, considering the use. So in this case, the planning board is considering the use of this site under a site plan review. And therefore the building commissioner uh, has um, sent the special permit application to the planning board. If this were a use that were um, under the jurisdiction of the zoning board of appeals, he would have sent the dimensional modification special permit to the zoning board of appeals. So the building commissioner has who has, he's the zoning enforcement officer in the town of Amherst and he has discretion to, um, to make certain decisions. And in this case, he's made the decision to uh, have the special permit for the modification of the dimensional requirement for the front setback go to the planning board because the planning board is um, considering the site plan review for the use. Thank you. I had, I had one other question, which was uh, regarding the findings that we are going to be discussing whether it would be a stronger finding to first find that the 6.6 .6 does not apply and then uh, grant the special permit versus finding that it does apply and granting the permit good question chris any insight on that well, I think that the building commissioner and I both feel that section 6.6 .6 does not apply, but we do encourage you to grant the special permit. So that would be the direction that we would encourage you to go in, but um, you may differ from that. And, um, and therefore you could find that section 6.6 section .6 does apply, but you would still grant the special permit. Well, so, assuming, assuming that this is headed toward at least the zoning board of appeals, if not other venues, uh, would we be making a stronger case for those other venues if we said both that it does not apply and granted the uh, permit? 
or would we not be making us stronger of, of the two choices? I think that would be a strong choice for you to make. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know which choice would be the more um, convincing in court, but, um, but I agree with the building commissioner that section 6.6 .6 does not apply in this case, and he has that discretion um, to make. And so my advice would be to um, find that section 6.6 .6 does not apply and then still to grant the special permit. And that would be part of a motion stating that like we're in agreement with you and the building commissioner that it does not, but we're still moving forward with granting the special. Yeah, and okay. The way the legal ad was written is um, that you would, you're being asked to grant the special permit uh, for this front setback if required. So you could even put that in your um, motion that um, if someone decides in the future that section 6.6 .6 does apply, then you are still granting this special permit. It's confirmation that you think that a 10 foot setback in this case, or a, actually it's a 13.3 foot setback, but um, that the 22, that the 20 foot setback is not really necessary. That um, um, the setback that's being proposed is appropriate. So in the preamble where I read, uh, if required, is that how it was stated in the ad? Is that what you said? Yes, that's right. So you might want to include that in your motion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, no uh, further comments. Okay, thanks, Doug. I'm gonna to move to Janet and then uh, Michael. Hi, um, thank you. Um, I find myself in a somewhat uncomfortable position but I, when I feel confident in, um, I do think that section 6.6 .6 applies and I would encourage the board to look at the language it says that table three's dimensional requirements quote shall apply to all educational and really religious uses located in the zoning districts and so this is an educational use and that's how they presented it there's no other I mean not an entertainment Amherst Media is educational and providing our community with um, you know tremendous and important um, services to our community. Um, also, the 6.6 the .6 goes on to say that all structures approved after January 1st, 1994 by a permit granting authority for, quote, for educational or religious uses. And so I would encourage the planning board not to think about, you know, the various lawsuits and sort of setting up um, what's the best way. I think we should need to do is look at our zoning bylaw the language is very simple. It's very clear. This is an educational use. This applies. And so then we move on to footnote A. And I think that footnote A applies. And I think the conditions for a special permit are easily met by this application. The supporting materials we've heard in previous hearings um, and the pre presentation by Mr. Sparkle tonight, um, the 13 foot setback is appropriate. And so I think we can very easily write an opinion that supports this special permit. Um, I could go through every you know, possible thing, but um, it is an appropriate use um, setback. It fits the neighborhood. You know, So much of this project is really trying to preserve the historic character of the district that it's in. And I think they've done an exceptional job with that. It, it, it fits into the neighborhood. I could, I could go through all the different special you know, permit conditions, but I do think we should not interpret the bylaw in a way for results, but in fact, use, the language is very simple. It's very clear, um, and I, you know, I do find myself disagreeing with um, the town attorney and the um, building commissioner, who I have tremendous respect for. And so, but I do think you could read the you read the bylaw as a layperson, and you can see this is a very broad term that would encompass this use. Um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Uh, yes. Uh, is there any reason why we couldn't simply avoid uh, voting uh, to uh, <clears throat> voting that 6.6 .6 applies and that, but simply grant the special permit, uh, which it would be a simpler approach to it. Uh, we're not in a position necessarily to rule on whether 6.6 .6 applies. Uh, it's been decided by the building commissioner that it does. And if we simply grant the grant the special permit, uh, isn't that isn't that enough? So I guess that's out to the board. So our two options, as I see it, is if um, the board feels we could take a uh, 
uh, motion to just vote on whether uh, either an agreement or not an agreement um, that it um, is impacted by 6.6 .6, or or we can not address it at all and, and just move forward with the special permit. Doug? Yeah, I wanted to ask Michael, and I, or at least to clarify what I thought he said, which was that the building commissioner had decided that 6.6 .6 did apply. I was under the impression he decided that it did not apply. Right. I assume that's what Michael meant. That is indeed what I meant. Uh, my in, my uh, idea is simply to avoid that question and to move on to the question of, the, of granting the special permit. Thank you. Would, um, Michael, a comment, a motion that says that we are voting to affirm the decision of the building commissioner and the director of planning, and, and that's part of our reasoning for granting the special permit? I don't, I don't think we need to do that. I think we just need to, to vote to approve uh, SP 2021-01 grant, to grant that special permit, period. Okay, so we've got two different ideas on the table. Um, if there's any other members who want to state that they feel one way or the other, if we want to make a statement that we're in agreement um, with the uh, town staff um, and then vote on the special permit, or would we just not even address it. So I see Janet's hand. Um, so I, I think what Michael's saying, and I, I endorse it, is the applicant has applied for a special permit and we can grant it or deny it, you know, on its merits. And if we don't need to say section 6.60 applies, why, you know, can we just, you know, they're asking for a special permit, we grant it, we don't have to make, you know, I, you know, and I, I, I can't vote to say, yes, it does. It doesn't apply. And I would actually be happy to write a memo on it. I was hoping that KP law would write something a bit more detailed, but I think I, you know, they've applied for a permit, special permit for whatever their reasons are, you know, let's vote to grant it or deny it on the, you know, the merits of their application and the bylaw requirements. I would support that idea. Okay. Thank you. Chris Bestrip. I see your hand. I just wanted to say, I think I agree with Michael that you could avoid the issue entirely and not make a finding on section 6.6, .6, but do add the words um, when you grant the special permit, if you choose to grant it, that you are um, allowing this modification of the front setback if required. if required. And that kind of leaves it up to someone else to determine whether it actually applies or not. Um, but you've granted the special permit and that gives um, confirmation that you agree that 10 feet or 13.3 feet is an appropriate setback for this um, particular location. Thank you. Uh, Michael, I see your hand. Uh, yeah, I move we close the public hearing and grant special permit 2021-01 if necessary. Um, Okay, uh, for, before we um, move on to a motion, I just want to confirm a few things. Uh, we should do final comments and check in with the public for any other additional comments. Um, and would we do, Chris, the special permit and the SPR at the same time? Should we do findings and conditions first or would we move forward with the special permit first, Chris? I think you can do them separately. You need to take a separate vote. Um, so I would definitely make separate motions. I have a question about whether you need to go through the findings of 10.38. Traditionally, what you have done um, in, when you're granting a special permit under footnote A is that you really look at the requirements of footnote A. And the requirement is that you um, examine what is going on in the surrounding neighborhood and if um, what is being requested um, is compatible with um, the a similar dimensional requirement in the surrounding neighborhood. In other words, these, these buildings across the street for the most part are 
closer to the French setback than Amherst Media is being uh, proposed to be, then you know, making that finding that um, complies with the language of footnote A, I think is really all you need to do. But if you want to go through the 10.38 um, special permit findings, we could do that as well. And I think that was the direction that Ms. McGowan was moving in. And maybe that makes sense because maybe it's, you know, again, belt and suspenders, just sort of confirming that this is really what you believe and you um, are voting, you know, with clear eyes that it, that you feel that it meets all the 10.38 criteria as well as the criteria contained in footnote A. So it's really up to you as far as what you okay. Thanks, I tend to agree with Ms. So I think we can handle this separate. If it's okay with the board, we can move forward with just the special permit right now and sort of um, take care of that. And then we can go back and take care of the, um, the site plan review. So Michael has proposed a motion. Would you be able to repeat that again, Michael? And we'll look for then a second. Sure. Um, I move we close the public hearing. For and, the special permit, yep. Uh, and uh, grant special permit request of SPP 2021-01 if that special permit turns out to be necessary. If, if required for a new building, yep. Second. We worked that one. And who second that, Maria? Is that okay, Maria? All right, so that's on the table. Um, at this point, can I just, uh, Pam, are you there? Can we just go to attendees to make sure that there's no additional, as, at this time, if there's any other final public um, comments to this? Um, I see one hand, so I'm going to address that. Um, I see Town Councilor uh, Dorothy Pam has raised her hand. I'm going to click allow to talk. Um, oh, I just did, Christine. Okay. Is she don't, good? Don't mute her. Yeah, no. Dorothy, think... can, can, can you hear us? Can you say hello? I don't see a mic. Isn't that weird? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Welcome. Right, we're, with, we're without power for the, we have no internet, so I'm on the phone, mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. which is interesting. Okay, I, I just wanted to, to make a little remark. Um, at this point, um, I don't have any argument with the whole question of the permit for educational institution. I, I follow the arguments and I have no problem with that, but I was a little bit unhappy with Bucky Sparkle's statement that the buildings, the setback was consistent with those that surrounded it, looking only to the east and across the street and ignoring the Amherst Woman Cl Women's Club and the Boys and Girls Club, which of course have huge setbacks. So I, I know the historical um, group worked as hard as they could to try to keep the new building as much out of the view range of those buildings. But I, I just think that in terms of the record, uh, it should be acknowledged that it's right next to incredible setbacks as part of the historical district. And, you know, the Amherst Women's Club has, is, is not fighting this. Um, many times things happen and people don't fight for lots and lots of reasons. But um, just understand that, that there is a change being made in a very beautiful block. And um, I know people are trying to do it in ways that are least injurious, but it, it is a serious matter. So that's, that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. All right. So coming back to the board. Um, so we're open for comments and discussions from us. I see uh, Janet McGowan's hand. I'm not seeing any other hands at this time. Um, so we're discussing the motion that's on the table right now. Janet. Um, I've never really understood until tonight that expression belts and suspenders. Um, I would think that when we discuss, we look at this, we might want to go beyond the usual um, practice of just looking at a few dimensional, you know, the special permit requirements about the neighborhood and dimensional requirements and fill in, you know, look at the other um, special permit requirements, um, which are very, most of them are very similar to the um, requirements of site plan review. And I think that would be a very, um, um, 
the comment that would be um, then the test of time or challenges. And so I, I, I would encourage to do that extra piece of looking at what we've seen in the record and how the, in the different criteria, what we've seen that would support those things. I, I know it sounds a little uh, tedious, but I just, you know, the belts, the suspenders, the raincoat, I don't know what else people wear, you know, but I think that um, maybe that's a prudent course of action. So, I, you know, I, I'm not sure. I just, that's my. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Chris, I don't have that in front of me. I don't know if we can pull it up on the shared screen before Mr. Sparkle pulls his down. Chris, do we have that that we can pull up to read? I didn't give it to you. Um, Pam, no. Pam can pull up um, page 99 of the Zoni bylaw. Um, okay, I, have, okay. I have it in front of me, so I can read it, and we can go through each one as I read them if that would be suitable. And maybe if Pam can find page 99, section 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Can you do that, Pam? So okay. the other part. I do have something. What you included in the email today, I did, I did, I did uh, do that. Let's 11. see if that's what you're referring to. I think that was 11.24. Yeah, that's a different one. But Chris, oh, all right. Why don't I just read them? Yeah, why don't you read it, Chris? Because that's what we normally do before Zoom. <laughs> so 10.380, um, the proposal is suitably located in the neighborhood in which it is proposed and or the total town and is deemed appropriate uh, by the special permit granting authority. Yes? Yes. Anybody disagree with that? If you disagree, raise your hand and I will be watching for those. Um, so Chris, you can keep going. I'll let you know if I see a raised hand. 10.381, the proposal is compatible with existing uses and other uses permitted by right in the same district. Um, you can say yes. You could also argue that um, the dimensional Modification doesn't really have anything to do with uses, but um, if you really want to do belt and suspenders, you can just say yes. I think I'm seeing no hands in protest, Chris, so I think everyone's in agreement. Okay. Um, the proposal does not constitute, would not constitute a nuisance due to air and water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, vibration, lights, or visually offensive structures or site features. I'm seeing no hands. <laughs> The proposal would not be a substantial inconvenience or hazard to cutters, vehicles, or pedestrians. I'm seeing no hands. Yes, okay. Um, 1.384, adequate and appropriate facilities will be provided for the proper operation of the proposed use. Agreement, I'm seeing no hands. 10.385. The proposal reasonably protects the adjoining premises against detrimental or offensive uses on the site, including air and water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, vibration, lights, or vis visually offensive structures or site features. Um, I do see Michael Burt whistle. I, I think it could be argued and uh, this is a complicated for me. Uh, we're talking about the special permit, which is essentially, uh, we're not talking about the uh, uh, site plan review here. We're talking about the special permit, correct? Yes. Correct. I think it could be argued that the special permit, uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, offensive structure, the visually offensive structure uh, is certainly, uh, there is no visually offensive structure uh, relative that the, the special permit is not concerned with that. Uh, but I think you could argue that the entire site plan uh, is visually offensive to the neighborhood. Um, it's not a question of the setback here. It's a question of the entire project. So there's, that's an issue. And I don't, I don't know how to resolve that. I would be happy to have somebody tell me how to resolve that. I wanted uh, I wanted to bring this up uh, in connection with uh, 10.380, uh, but I couldn't get 
to unmute myself quickly enough and raise my hand quickly enough. I've got a new system with my uh, my computer. Um, but the, the, the suitably located in the neighborhood in which it is proposed, um, I, I would submit that um, it is certainly the um, the setback question, the propose the projecting. Um, element uh, from the building that is in question is appropriate uh, to the neighborhood, but I would still question whether or not the entire structure is uh, appropriate to the neighborhood. I understand that the historical commission, uh, the historic district commission has approved the, the proposal. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, I am, um, uh, I am persuaded by that largely um but if we're making a finding specific to these quest to these uh um uh, to the language in 10.30 uh 38 uh, sorry uh then uh, i'm not so sure about uh, the question of uh suitably located and or visual and visually offensive in uh 10.10.380 10 and 10.385 Chris Pestrup. Well, that's why I usually try to limit um, when we're making findings about dimensional modifications, I try to limit the finding to the specific dimensional modification rather than going through 10.38 because 10.38 really relates more to the use, which is normally, you know, if this is a ZBA special permit for the use, you would go through all of these uh, items here. So I, I think there's some uh, reason not to go through 10.38, but um, Ms. McGowan thinks that it's a good idea and it's more strengthening of your um, decision. So it's possible that you could take a vote on each one of these if you wanted to. And if Mr. Bert Whistle wishes to disagree with 10.380 and 10.385, maybe that's um, that's what we should do here. We should say, well, we have one, we have a kind of a, what is it? Five to one vote on 380, whether it is met or not, and a five to one vote on 10.385. I don't know. I mean, that's that's one way to do it. Maybe vote to approve or not approve the special permit. Uh, I do agree with you, Chris, where we're sort of diving wider on the special permit than what we were actually what's been requested for a special permit. Um, I'll, I see Janet's hand. So a very similar in, when we get to the site plan review, there's a very, very similar language and a requirement about visually offensive structures and harmony, you know, like fitting in with, you know, with abutting properties. So I think that um, as much as you might want to escape the issue, it's just going to show up again in the site plan review. So I think that maybe having a vote on that and having it, you know, five one or whatever. But I understand Michael's, you know, qualm, basic qualm. But I think that, you know, the special permit and site plan review criteria are very similar and they're very overlapping. Not quite though. I mean, special permit permit is a little more rigorous. But we're going to have the same issue, or Michael will have the same question and issue when we get to site plan review and start reading through those criteria. So I think we just have to face it. And I just, I, you know, I know this seems like a tedious exercise. Every part of the new special permit criteria, sorry. And, you know, we're going to, we're not going to have skipped any point. We'll be wearing our belt, our suspenders, our rain boots, you know, whatever. And so, it takes a few minutes here and we might have some disagreements, but I think we should go forward. Okay, well, what is the, what, may I speak? Yes. What is the conclusion about 10.385? Do, um, is there a general consensus? Well, I think Michael has spoken against it. Uh, do we, uh, I, I don't think I, we need to take a vote on each issue. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm simply raising a question. I, I don't necessarily want to vote against it. Uh, in fact, I, I don't want to vote against it in terms of the special permit request. Because I think the special permit request is, is a modification, is a request to modify what is an existing design in place, which we theoretically will be approving in site plan review. 
Um, and I, I think they're separate issues. Uh, and I am not concerned with uh, the setback issue as according with the whole building. I'm, I'm concerned with the whole building. So I don't really think we need to go into the issue of uh, the set, the site back, the setback with, uh, with, with great detail. I think we should just simply grant the setback uh, modification. Uh, and if in fact, uh, I, if, <laughs> I, I, and, and, let, and let the issue of whether the building belongs on that site go to site plan review and not worry about it now. Okay, well your motion is on the floor um, and Ms. McGowan wants to go through each one of these items. I am going to switch to, I see Doug's hand up and then Jack. Well, I was just gonna say that when I look at 10.38, the words suitably located mean to me we're not putting a bar in a residential neighborhood. So putting this educational use into the neighborhood that we are talking about here seems perfectly appropriate without any further discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I would just, I would just also, the, the historical commission's decision on this weighs heavily in terms of it fitting or not. So for me, it's a, you know, kind of a moot issue uh, I'd like to vote, you know, the special permit findings in it in their entirety. Okay, um, Chris, is there any more to read on those? Since I can't see them, Actually. yes, there's several more. I can okay. read them quickly. Um, so I'm going to say about 10.385 general consensus, but um, some disagreement. Um, 10.386 is. The proposal ensures that it is in conformance with the parking and sign regulations of this bylaw. So what you would have to say there is that um, this proposal has asked for modifications of the parking requirements and that when you get to the point of um, your site plan review, you will determine whether you're going to grant that parking modification or not. Right? Um, um, I'm going to put down Doug and Jack's hands. Um, and if anyone has an issue, then re raise your hand up. Keep going, Chris. 10.387, the proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular and pedestrian movement within the site and in relation to adjacent streets, property, or improvements. If the special permit granting authority deems the proposal likely to have a significant adverse impact on traffic patterns, it shall be permitted to require a traffic impact report, and the proposal shall comply with section 11.2437 of this bylaw. So they've asked for um, a, a, um, a waiver of the requirement for a traffic impact statement. So that's something that you would grant under your um, site plan review. Right. Um, 10.388 is the proposal ensures adequate space for the off street loading and unloading of vehicles goods, products, materials, and equipment incidental to the normal operation of the establishment or use. Agreement, not seeing any hands. 10.389, the proposal provides adequate methods of disposal and or storage for sewage, refuse, recyclables, and other wastes resulting from the uses permitted or permissible on the site and methods of drainage for surface water. I see no hands agreement. Okay, um, 10.390 is not applicable because it talks about flood hazards um, and refers to the flood conservancy district, flood prone conservancy district, and this is not in that district. So I think we would say it's not applicable here. Um, 10.391, the proposal protects to the extent feasible, unique or important natural, historic or scenic features. And here you could refer to the um, Local Historic District Commission um, Certificate of Appropriateness. Agreement, Chris, I see no hands. 10.392, um, let me see what page I'm on here. Um, the proposal provides adequate landscaping, including the screening of adjacent residential uses, provision of street trees, landscape islands, and the parking lot 
and a landscape buffer along the street frontage. When a non residential use adjoins a residential district, an uninterrupted vegetative buffer shall, to the extent feasible, be established and maintained between buildings associated with uses under this section and the nearest residential property boundaries. Um, I would say that they're, instead of providing a, an uninterrupted vegetated buffer, they're providing a, a stone wall um, in the direction of, uh, in the northerly direction, and they're providing vegetation in the westerly direction. I agree. I see no um, hand. Uh, 10.393, the proposal provides protection of adjacent properties by minimizing the intrusion of lighting, including parking lot and exterior lighting, for use of cutoff luminaires, light shields, lowered height of light poles, screening, or similar solutions. Um, all exterior lighting shall be downcast and shall be directed or shielded to eliminate light trespass onto an, any street or abutting property and to eliminate direct or reflected glare perceptible to persons on any street or abutting property and sufficient to reduce the viewer's ability to see. All site lighting, including architectural sign and parking lot lighting, shall be kept extinguished outside of those business hours established under an approved site management plan, except for lighting determined to be necessary for site security and the safety of employees and visitors. Agreement, I see no hands. Um, 10.394, the proposal avoids to the extent feasible impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, and wetlands. Um, there really aren't any steep slopes or floodplains here and, or substantial grade changes or wetlands. And in terms of scenic views, um, again, you could refer to the certificate of appropriateness that the um, local historic district um, granted and make a comment about the effort that has been made to keep the building out of the um, view shed of the uh, adjacent property um, owned by Harms Bay. Agreement, see no hands. Um, the last, or excuse me, not the last one, the 10.395, the proposal does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain and to the use scale and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity, which have functional or visual relationship there too. Uh, within the BN zone and others, which are also mentioned, any res and any residential zoning district where the project in question occurs within the boundaries of a national registered district, which this does, um, the board, uh, the permit granting authority shall, if it deems the proposal likely to have a significant impact on its surroundings, be permitted to use the design principles and standards set forth in the design review board section of the zoning bylaw to evaluate the design of the proposed architecture and landscape alterations. And again, I think that this has been reviewed by the local historic district commission with great detail with regard to the um, architectural features. So I think that um, there's really no necessity to uh, invoke the design principles and standards of the design review board. Agreement, I see no hands. Um, 10.396, the proposal provides screening for storage areas, loading docks, dumpsters, rooftop equipment, utility buildings, and similar features. There are no dumpsters or rooftop equipment, no loading docks. Uh, there, is a, there is a utility area out back and there is screening around the utility area, both by the wall, the stone wall, and by the um, shrubbery that's provided to the west. Agreement, I see no hands. Okay, 10.397. The proposal provides adequate recreational facilities, open space, and amenities for the proposed use. I think this is an NA, not, um, not uh, applicable. Okay. applicable. Um, and the last one is the, the, um, the proposal of the master plan. Yes? I, I see one hand, Janet McGowan. Janet, you're on mute. Janet, you can't. Move. My hair. 
So you also have a tough so, connection. You keep breaking up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of in the national. Um, I was going to say there's a recreational area. You know, a lot of this. we're having a hard time understanding you. You're all okay. garbled. Skip me. Um, I'll try turning off a couple of mics and see if that makes a difference. Hold on, Chris. I'm just going to mute you for a minute. Um, everyone is muted except for Pam and I. Do you want to try again, Janet? Yeah, I was just saying there is, you know, there's a whole empty lot for recreational space if it comes to that. So I think we talked about that during the hearing. So. Okay, we could hear half of that. Your your Wi-Fi must be um, a little rough wherever you are. Okay, Doug Marshall, I see his. Well, first, Doug, hold up. I'm going to call on Chris. I see her hand up. And then, Doug, you're next. Oh, Chris, okay. yeah. I wanted to say, I heard what Janet said. She said there is an, there's no need to say that um, the recreational uh, requirement is not applicable because there is a recreational area in the empty lot next to the building. So we can say that instead of not applicable. Is that satisfactory? I think she's nodding. Doug? Okay. Yeah, I was going to have a slightly different argument to say I didn't think that it was not applicable, which is to say that I, that I find it is adequate for the proposed use, which says needs essentially no recreational space. Chris, which do you think is best? Oh, either one. Um, but we could say it's adequate for the proposed use, which needs no recreational space. However, lot available next. Sorry, you didn't hear any of that. Yeah. So <laughs> heard half of it. Sorry. Can you say that again? So which one do you lean towards? I'd say combine them. Combine them. Adequate They're for the not... proposed use, which needs no recreational space. However, if recreational space is needed, there's an empty lot right next door to the west of the building. How about that? That sounds wonderful. Um, I see no other hands. Okay, we got through that. I think we're fully dressed and have raincoats and, and hard hats on. Mm -hmm. So at this time, are there any other? Um, I think you should go through footnote A. Oh, where's, oh, <laughs> what page is that on? Do you know? It's on page 81, it says, the requirement, meaning the dimensional requirement, may be modified under a special permit. Um, oh, in applying the criteria of section 395, the special permit granting authority shall consider the proposed modified dimensional requirement in the context of the pattern of the same dimensions established by existing buildings and landscape features in the surrounding neighborhood. So we can make a statement um, that you have found that the uh, testimony presented by Mr. Sparkle with regard to setbacks on the other side of the street um, meets the meets this requirement. Yes. Is that reasonable? I think that's reasonable. I'm not seeing any hands. Okay. Anything else um, that we... I think that's it. Okay, so at this time, um, if there's any other comments or questions, either from the applicant or um, from the board members, I'm watching for hands. I would have a very minor comment, if uh -huh. permitted. Um, and that's, that's to address Dorothy Pam's um, indication about uh, the setbacks. I don't think it's a big deal, but if uh, you were back at my screen that you know, I was really talking about the, the commercial buildings in the BN zoning district and the Amherst Women's Club and the Henry Hills House are, are not that type of building whatsoever. And I don't believe are in the BN district, if I'm correct. Um, so I was really trying to compare apples and apples to things that were closest, not only in proximity, but in, in use and functionality. 
Uh, there aren't a lot of pieces of property in downtown Amherst that are anything like the Amherst Women's, Women's Center or a club. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm glad we don't have to live up to the standards of that magnificent property. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands at this time. Um, so I'm assuming that we are ready to vote on the special permit. Chris, is there anything else we need to do or can we take a vote? Can take a vote. Okay, so I will do a roll call. Um, do we need, does anyone need to hear the motion again? Are we good? No hands. Okay, so I'll do a roll call. This is for, um, actually I'll say it's for SPP 2021-01 Amherst Community Television, DBA Amherst Media, corner of Gray Street and Main Street to approve their special permit request. So, uh, Michael Burt Whistle? Yes. Maria Chow? Approve. Jack Jemsick? Approve. Doug Marshall? Approve. Janet McGowan. Approve. And myself, Christine Gray Mullen, approve. So that's six zero zero. And that closes out the uh, <clears throat> permit. So now we're gonna go back to our site plan review. And I'll open it up to the board. Um, are there any questions or concerns uh, that they wanna ask about the site plan review? We also can comment on, we were sent, I'm digging here through our massive paper, uh, findings and conditions that hopefully people gave a look to. I'm pulling out one right now. Um, okay, conditions and findings. Um, okay, so Janet. Janet, you are muted, so we cannot hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have a question, which is, can we vote on the site plan review and then add findings later? Because I have a, a bunch of findings I'd like to add to a decision if the board votes to approve it again, strengthen decision and refer to the um, testimony and evidence that we've seen. I don't want to go through it now because I think it'd be kind of a tedious thing. So I wondered if we could vote, if the vote is to approve, I could send Christine Brester my, you know, supplement to her findings and we could look at it at our next thing is, or is there a desire to wrap it all up tonight? Are you, are you saying you want us to approve the site plan review and then you would send more findings to be added to it? Or, um, I guess I'm just, I, I guess I can just, I'm just trying to, um, I, I'm asking how that's if that could be done, and if it if it seems. Wouldn't we have to vote on those? No, I'm just I just Chris. Okay, then I can just add findings now. Okay. I think that's how it works, so that would be great. Um, so you have findings you want to add to the already draft findings list, and you have possible conditions. So normally. Um, Chris, confirm with me, I would read through the draft findings like what we were doing, and then if there's things to add, Chris, I see your hand up. Feel free to talk if you, you could probably say this better than me. So what I would suggest is that Christine Gray Mullen read the draft finding and then Janet um, add whatever she wants to add, and then um, the, there'd be discussion about whether others feel the same way for each of these things. And then in the end, Janet can send me her written document and I can incorporate it into the findings, but you should make your findings before you take your vote because you're gonna vote on the findings and the conditions and the waivers and to approve the site plan review. So it should all right. be in this moment. So we wouldn't want people to think that board members are, you know, slipping their stuff in later. We wanna do it as a board and make it look like it, there's unity. Um, I had slipped it a little earlier. I'm just on vacation this week, so I didn't get to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jack, 
vice chair, I'm going to ask a favor of you. Wake up. You're in your sunflower field there. Um, if you could do what I was doing for Chris, can you watch the hands and let me know if a hand goes up while I'm reading because Chris is writing. Okay. And, uh, I can have Pam's doing other things too, but she and I was I was not sleeping. I was I was. I didn't accuse you of sleeping. <laughs> I was slouching. I was slouching. You were slouching in your yeah. field of flowers. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna read. You know, just so y'all know, you probably see it's a page and a half. It's about um, what Chris read. So if you want to add or you want um, something in that um, section, please raise your hand and Jack. Either say, approve, Jack, no hands, or call on their hand. Okay. All right. The board found under section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw, site uh, plan review as follows. 11.2400. The project is in conformance with all the appropriate visit provisions of the zoning bylaw, the applicant is applying for a special permit to modify the front setback requirement under footnote A of table three to overcome the apparent doubling of the setback requirement in section 6.60 of the zoning bylaw for educational and religious uses. The applicant is also applying for a modification of the parking requirements under section 7.9 of the zoning bylaw. 11.2401, town amenities and abutting properties will be protected through minimizing detrimental or offensive actions. The proposed use of the property is unlikely to create detrimental or offensive actions. 11.2402, abutting properties will be protected from detrimental site characteristics resulting from the proposed use. Lights will be downcast or shielded. 11.2403 NA provision uh, of recreational facilities is not relevant to this use. Uh, just saying, do we want to make it the same as we had with the special permit? Yes. Okay. I'll do that. So, uh, 11.2403 reference special permit finding. Yes. Thank you. 11.2410, uh, unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features will be protected. The local historic district commission held seven public meeting sessions, hearing sessions with the applicant and worked with the applicant to resolve design issues, eventually agreeing to a building that fits well in its surroundings. The local historic district commission issued a certificate of appropriateness for the building in January, and the new building will not, will not block views of the historic, the women's club, or the Henry F. Hills house since the building is confined to the eastern side of the site and the grassy area to the west is maintained as open space. 11.211, I'm sorry, point two four one one. The project provides adequate methods of refuse disposal as described in the uh, movie. We have a hand. Yeah. Okay, Michael. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, uh, back to the previous one. Um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of lost. Where are we? Um, We're in 11.2410, unique okay. and important natural, historic, or scenic feature. Right. Uh, a third line, uh, resolves design issues, eventually agreeing to a building that fits in. I would suggest that we say that eventually agreeing that the building fits in well with its surroundings because it's a little difference. Um, they agreed that the building fits in well, uh, when you say agreeing to a building that fits in well, what you're saying is that you're making the decision that the building fits in well. The historic commission made that decision. We can agree with it or not. I tend not to, but I think it's it's more appropriate of what they did just to use the, to use that uh, that language. Uh, eventually, agreeing that a the building fits in well. Makes sense. You want to see that, Chris? Yeah. Agreeing to that the building fits eventually, well. Eventually agreeing that the building fits in well. Fits in well. That the proposed well. building, if you if okay. you prefer. did you get that, Chris? Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any hands of disagreement. So um all right. Thanks. Is that it, Michael? Yes, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna go to eleven point 
2412. Uh, Jack, if you're back on, the project will be connected to town sewer and water and the town engineer has reviewed and has not expressed concerns about the town services or their ability to serve the proposed use. 11.2413, the proposed drainage system within and adjacent to the site will be adequate to handle the stormwater. The town engineer has reviewed and has not expressed concerns about the proposed stormwater management system. 11.2414, provision of the adequate landscaping has been addressed and the project includes new plantings on site. 11.2415, the soil erosion condition uh, control methods are considered adequate to control soil erosion both during and after construction. 11.2416, adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusive, intrusion of various nuisances. A construction logistics plan is required to be submitted prior to the issuance of a building permit. 11.2417, adjacent properties will be protected from the intrusion of lighting because a condition of the permit requires that exterior lighting be downcast or shielded and or shielded and not shine onto adjacent properties. 11.2418 NA, the property is not located in a flood prone conservation uh, conservancy district. 11.2419 NA, there is no wetlands on or within 100 feet of the property. 11.2420, the planning board did not choose to refer to the design principles or standards set forth in sections 3.3040 and 3.2041 of the zoning bylaw because of the local historic district commission has done a thorough review of the building design and its location on the site and has issued a certificate of appropriate 11.2421, the development is reasonably considered with respect to setbacks, placement of parking, landscaping and entrances and exits with surrounding buildings and development. The applicant is applying for a special permit to modify the front setback requirement under footnote A of table three to overcome the apparent doubling of the setback requirement in section 6.60 of the zoning bylaw for educational and religious uses. 11.2422, building sites shall avoid to the extent feasible the impact on sleep, <laughs> steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, and grade changes and wetlands. There is no steep slopes or floodplains on this on the site. The applicant has located the proposed building uh, to be mostly outside of the view to or from the women's club and the Henry Hill Henry F Hill's house. There is no serious grade change proposed and there's no wetlands on or near the property. 11.2423 NA, there is only one building proposed for the site. 11.2424 screening has been provided as appropriate via a stone wall at the north side of the property and via a slope and set of plantings along the west edge of the parking lot. 11.2430, the site has been designed to provide for the convenience and the uh, safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement both within the site and in relation to the adjoining ways and properties. The parking lot, although tight, has been carefully designed to allow backup and turning uh, movements and pedestrian circulation. 11.2431, the location of the curb cut has been designed to minimize turning movements and hazardous exits and entrances. And the applicant has submitted a plan showing uh, turning movements within the parking lot. The town engineer has reviewed the location of the curb cut in relation to the intersection of Main Street and Gray Street and has found the location to be satisfactory. 11.2432, the location and design of the parking spaces, bicycle racks, drive aisles, loading areas, and sidewalks have been, um, have been provided in a safe and convenient manner. 11.2433, N.A., provision for the access to adjoining properties is not an issue. 11.2434, the proposed driveway is located almost opposite one of the driveways from 446 Main Street. 11.2435 NA, joint access driveways between the adjoining properties is not an issue since the adjacent property has an existing driveway on the other northern side of the property. 11.2436, the requirement for um, Submittal of a traffic impact statement has been waived. There is very little traffic expected to enter or leave the site, and traffic at the site does not overturn, uh, overlap in terms of timing with traffic to and from the nearby school. 11.2437 NA, no traffic import, no traffic impact report will be required. The end.
All right, so that's findings. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands for additional findings. I can move straight on to the conditions. Oh, I just saw two hands. Jack, well, first Jack, Chris Bester, and then Jack. Sorry, she it, always would, trumps you. So I would, who's Jack, going first? Chris is gonna go first, just to oh, make okay. whatever she, and then you, thanks. <laughs> yes, Chris. So Janet has some additional findings that she would like to um, describe to you before you vote on these findings. Okay, so I'll go to Jack and then I'll go to Janet. Thank you. Jack? Yeah, I was just going to say for 11.2436 that uh, you mentioned the bus stop somewhere in there. Uh, you know, public transportation is proximal, very proximal uh, to the site. Yeah. Good addition. Yeah. Anything else, Jack? Nope. Okay, so I'll move to Janet. Janet, um, just so I can find space on paper, how many uh, findings are you proposing? Janet, you're um, muted, so we can't hear you. Okay, I'm going to skip the additional findings, but I do have a question about whether, um, about the waiver of the parking requirement. Do we have to vote on that separately, or does it have to be mentioned in the findings that we, the board has agreed to waive parking requirement? based on the information presented to it about very little need for parking? I assume that's under the, go ahead, Chris. Um, when you uh, make the motion about the site plan review, you will um, include uh, the findings, the conditions, and the waivers. And if you want to know exactly what the waivers are, I can tell you they are in the, um, in the document that has been disappeared from my desk here. Um, the yeah. development application report that was part of your packet for July 15th had the waivers yeah. on. There you go. Chris, I think I have that. You have that the development application report that was in the packet for July 15th. So that I list do. of waivers. Great. Okay, and then you can, um, you can see what waivers were requested. This is the special permit. What yeah, I just have to get there. Hold on. I don't have that within my here, so I'd love to see that again. Thank you. Okay. Here we are. Oh, here they are. Waivers. Traffic impact statement, number of parking spaces, and the proximity of parking driveways to the building. Okay. Those were the three waivers, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Pam, could you pop up, uh, you probably have it, the uh, possible conditions? Mm -hmm. This might be easy for people to see it while I, mm -hmm. I have to read this, which I have to warn everyone, it's even longer than my last bit. Here they are. Okay, so let me, Jack, are you back on? Can you watch hands? Uh, Jack, your hand is actually up. Do you have something to say? Jack? Yes, oh. I'm here. So I'm gonna um, read if you can kind of watch hands again and um, sure. and Chris is gonna scribble away and check. So, okay. So this is possible conditions for a site plan review for Amherst Media, SPR 2020-11. All right, under general, number one, development shall be built substantially in accordance with the plan submitted to the planning board and approved on and Chris, we just leave these blank for now because we don't know. That's right. Yeah. Number two, development shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on to be determined. Three, upon a change of ownership or if the property is no longer managed by Amherst Media, the new owner and or manager shall submit a new management plan to the planning board at the public meeting for its review and approval. The purpose of the meeting shall be for the board to determine whether conditions of a permit are being com um, complied with and whether any modifications to the site plan review, approval, or management plan is required. Uh, sorry, I just saw Chris yeah, threw me off. Chris, are you trying to say something? 
I wanted to say something about um, the Massengill letter, which mentions this condition. Um, I think he misunderstood the condition because this condition applies if somebody's coming in and um, doing essentially what media is doing now, but it's a different company. Um, if there's a change in use, the building commissioner would look at that change in use and determine whether it is um, similar enough to Amherst Media's use that uh, someone could just bring in a new management plan to the planning board, or if it's substantially different from Amherst Media's use, in which case they would be required to file a new site plan review or special permit application. So this is really just for um, say Amherst Media changed its name or say a new company took over from Amherst Media to do essentially what Amherst Media is doing, um, they would come back to the planning board with a change in the management plan. Otherwise, it would be a whole new ball of wax and it would go through the building commissioner and he would determine that it needs either a site plan review or a special permit for a new use. Thank you for um, identifying that and clarifying. Thank you, Chris. Number four, all exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant. Exterior lighting shall be downcast shielded or shall not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. Five, changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plans or to the exterior of the building shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change and or determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the special permit or the site plan review approval. Six, landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscaping plan prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy and once installed shall be continually maintained. All disturbed areas shall be loomed and seated otherwise, unless otherwise specified. Uh, construction section number seven, prior to the Chris, I just want to say, um, didn't we in the past decide like number nine, we can just say a construction logistics plan and not read like I through J? Can I do that? You don't even have to read them, but I think the building commissioner would um, encourage you to keep them in here. Oh, keep them in, but do I have to, can I just say, read the first, like a construction logistics plan shall be provided at the pre-construction meeting. That's and right. and, and cover, shall cover the uh, following items, A through J. Yes. And I, okay. And I see Doug Marshall, your hand. Um, okay. I don't see you, but. Uh, yeah, I'm here. There you are. Hello. Yeah, I, uh, number six. Uh, no, in, yes. in my experience, it's not uncommon for the landscaping to be, to, to wait to install the landscaping until you get to either a, the right time of year for planting shrubs and that kind of thing, which could be after the certi certificate of occupancy or at least the temporary certificate of occupancy has been issued. So, you know, I think, I don't know what the practice here is in this town, but I think it might be uh, a benefit to the owner to have a requirement that the landscaping be installed within six months of the certificate of occupancy or something like that. I agree. Chris, has this yep. ever come up before? So what usually happens is that someone applies for a temporary certificate of occupancy and gets into the building and then finishes up the last few things um, that need to be finished. And the building commissioner is um, generous in his um, acceptance of the fact that landscaping is often not installed at the time that the building is finished and a temporary certificate of occupancy is, um, is issued. So this wording seems to be working in our world, but if you would like to modify it, you, you can do that. Um, but this, it, it's worked in the past and it seems like uh, the building commissioner can, can work with this language. That's fine. Let's leave it. If that's okay. like I said, I don't know the practice in town. Sure. And now that Chris has said it, that is, I guess, how it's worked in the past. And and you and there haven't been complaints, Chris. Oh, there are always complaints. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but everything gets worked out. It works out in the end. Yep. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, so number. 
under construction number seven prior to the issuance of any building permit a pre-construction meeting shall be scheduled with the applicant the applicant's contractor the town engineer the building commissioner the superintendent of public works planning staff and the fire chief and any other staff personnel that uh, may have a role in the construction of the project eight a written construction fire management plan shall be submitted to the fire chief and building commissioner prior to the issuance of a building permit Nine, a construction logistics plan shall be provided at the pre-construction meeting and shall cover all the following items, A through J. Number 10, a construction logistics plan shall be subject to the following conditions as listed A through D. Um, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, um, there is one, I just noticed this. Could, and and Pam, flip the page. Come again? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, and there is, this condition may need to be amended there's some question on B before I just, Chris, is that something we need to, whoop, we need to address right now on number 10. Whoa. 10. 10. There we go. 10 B, Chris. Go ahead. Ask Mr. Sparkle what his plans are for parking for contractors. I believe he said to me recently, or it was written um, in an email that um, parking for contractors would be accommodated on the site and so this um, condition can apply. So I don't think it needs to be amended, but we might want to confirm that with Mr. Sparkle. Uh, Mr. Sparkle. Yes, um, and I'm actually taking this on the word of the expected site contractor. Uh, they do anticipate keeping all construction equipment and materials on the site during the project, and they'll just be doing a little bit of do -si do as the project continues from one area to the other in intensity. Dozy Doe. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so I'll move on. Up, oh, Doug. I see your hand popped up. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sparkle just said equipment and materials would be on the site. He did not say all the contractor parking. Oh, you know, what? I guess I think of vehicles as equipment, but um, yes. Yeah, so the park parking also on site. I, I think we can get everybody on there. Yes. So nobody parking on Gray Street. That's the most important thing, yes. I mean, perhaps a contractor might fly other places, other properties off street to stage materials. They sometimes do that at their own convenience, but we're not going to be occupying the public right away for this construction process. Thanks for the clarification, Doug. Excellent. 11. As part of the building permit application, the applicant shall provide the building commissioner the name, address, and business telephone number of the project manager or on-site supervisor who shall be responsible for all activities on the project site. 12. There shall be no exterior construction activity, including fueling of vehicles, on the project site before 7 a.m. or after 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. There shall be no construction on the project site on the following legal holidays. New Year's Day, Memorial Day, 4th of July, or July 4th, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. The applicant agrees that the hours of operation shall be enforceable by the Amherst Police Department and or Inspection Services. 13, the project site shall be fenced during construction. 14, appropriate measures shall, shall, uh, shall be taken to control dust, dirt, debris, and construction materials on the site. Water for dust control shall be trucked in from off-site unless otherwise approved by the Department of Public Works. 15. All catch basins shall be protected from soil and debris contamination during construction and shall be cleaned at the end of construction. 16. No stumps, demolition material, or construction debris shall be buried or disposed of at the project site. 17. Town engineer and the building commissioner shall inspect the construction of the entry driveway and all on-site paved areas for conformance to town standards. 18. The applicant shall provide as-built plans that show building location, grades, access ways, parking areas, sidewalks and walkways, curbing, mm -hmm. uh, stormwater management facilities, lighting and utilities to the building commissioner, town engineer, and to be placed uh, with the site plan review decision in the uh, planning department. 19. The final certificate of occupancy shall not be issued until A. Final top coat of paving for all driveways and access areas, sidewalks, and berms have been completed. B. Uh, landscaping, as shown on the plan of record, has been installed. C. As built plans um, have been submitted to the uh, building commissioner and the town engineer by all the design professionals for the site and building construction and have been approved by the building commissioner and town engineer. 
2020, a temporary certificate of occupancy may be granted by the building commissioner. Any incomplete work may require a bond. Okay, I see Michael Burt was still has his hand up. Oops. Michael, what number? Here we go. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay. What number? Number, number 20. Uh, number 20. Any, any complete work will require a bond as opposed to may require a bond. We've been going back and forth about bonding a bit lately. Uh, so maybe we ought to be more specific about that. Will require a bond. Uh, we don't always require, I mean, are you talking about the, the three-party agreement kind of thing for subdivisions? We've or? been talking about various kinds of bond with, with, the, with the subdivision, with the exchange of, of properties, lot one, lot eight, lot four for lot seven. Uh, this is the third time, well, there are three times bonding has come up in recent months. Right, right. So, Maybe Chris can talk about this more, but I think that's for subdivisions and this is... Well, this is, it, I mean, it's here, may Chris, require a bond. I'm just saying, should it? Chris, can you give any examples where a bond would be required? Well, I think if someone were, um, were not able to complete, say, the planting um, in time for what they need as a final certificate of occupancy, then they could be required by the building commissioner to um, up a bond, but that would be up to the building commissioner, and he has control over that process because he can refuse to grant the final certificate of occupancy if people don't comply. So they, it's sort of a negotiation at the end of a project. If for some reason the winter's been really bad and they haven't been able to get into the site, but they really need a final certificate of occupancy, but they haven't completed all the planting or the seeding or the seeding isn't working out well or something like that, then the building commissioner can say, well, I will issue a certificate of occupancy, a final one, but you need to give me a bond. So it's, it's kind of giving the building commissioner um, the ability to do that. He can do it anyway, but this is putting the um, developer on notice that the building commissioner may do this. So it is a little different from the subdivision because the subdivision really, the building commissioner doesn't have much to do with that. It's really all the, the town engineer who, you know. Right. different parties. And Chris, do you know if this has happened many times in the last? I think it's happened, it happened recently um, because of when he's Pleasant Street. Um, I remember this. Yeah. Investments stated that they would, um, work with the town to design and install signage for the West Cemetery to direct people back to the West Cemetery from North Pleasant Street. And they never really followed through on that. So the building commissioner got them to put a bond, I think $25,000 bond up um, because they wanted a final certificate of occupancy for the building, but they hadn't complied with that requirement. So he's got a $25,000 bond to make that happen even though they didn't make it happen themselves. So that's the kind of thing that, um, that would be useful. Does that explain it? Is that, does, so is, does the existing wording sound okay, Michael? I was gonna suggest, why don't, we re, why don't we insert the phrase, at the building commissioner's discretion after bond. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. And I think that's the end. So, um, are there any other questions um, or any other conditions that anyone wants to add? Any other last questions for the applicant? I'm not seeing any hands. Um, Chris, do you have any last statements? Or at this point, could we uh, take a motion? Doug Marshall had his hand raised. I start up. I see it back up. Um, yeah, I was just going to remind everybody we need to make sure those three waivers are included in the motion. Yeah. We will, in the motion, um, close the public hearing. You want to include the conditions, the findings, and the waivers. Anyone feel motivated? I do, Doug. <laughs> and then I see Maria. 
Well, I mean, I guess I will move that we close the public hearing and what was it? Include the waivers, the findings, and the conditions? Yeah, the findings, conditions, and the waivers. Yeah. And approve the site plan review? Yes, for approval yeah. of the site move plan. Move that we approve the site plan review. Excellent. Second. And a second from Maria. Okay, so that's on the table. Um, any other questions uh, mm -hmm. from the board members? I see Jack's hand. Yeah, I just forget the three waivers. Can we say what those are again? I'm just there's the um, parking um, waiver. There's the um, traffic impact statement and the proximity to the uh, someone help me the parking yeah, proximity of parking driveways to the building. Yes, that's it. Okay. Thanks, Pam. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, I'm seeing no other hands. I see Michael's hand. Did we have a second on the motion? Yes, Maria. Yeah. And Michael, your hand's up, but you are muted. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to say that I intend to vote yes on this site plan approval, even though I think this is the wrong building in the wrong place. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are bound by a bad decision that town meeting made some years ago to rezone this piece of property. Uh, and that gives the owner of the property essentially the right to build the building that they're proposing. Uh, I think the uh, Historic District Commission has done a wonderful job trying to make this building reasonable for the site. Uh, and in fact, since the building has, since the owners have the right to build the building, uh, they've done about the best they can do. Um, I just need to register the fact that I believe this building uh, should never have been built there, that the land should never have been rezoned, and that this, dis this building destroys the uh, remaining uh, ground space that uh, fronts the Hills House and the Women's Club. Uh, and it's a, it's, it's a, for me, it's a great shame that the building is being built there. Uh, nonetheless, I'm afraid the uh, owner have, has the right to do it, so I will vote yes. Any other comments? Uh, Chris? Um, I just wanted to note that prior to this land being um, rezoned, I believe that the land had been divided into um, two frontage lots. And at that time it was in the RG zoning district. So um, if this rezoning hadn't occurred, um, two individual single family homes could have been built on each of those lots, or excuse me, one single family home could have been built on each of those lots in the RG district. So the result, probably would have been, well, that was prior to um, the local historic district commission having been formed. So I don't know what would have happened then, but in, in any event, I just wanted to say that um, that, would, uh, that would have been a possibility back then before this property was rezoned that um, two single family homes could have been built here and the planning board wouldn't have had any control and the zoning board wouldn't have had any control. And so it would have actually marred the view of the two buildings um, significantly. Just wanted to remind everyone of that. Thank you, Chris. That was important history to hear. I'm seeing no other hands at this time. So I think we're ready to do a roll call vote. If you have something to say, speak now. I see nothing. Um, and I'm sorry, I have to sneeze. <laughs> All right, fought it off. Okay, um, Michael Burt Yes. Is, okay, and just this is for the site plan review. Yes. And Michael Burt said yes. Maria Chow? Approve. Jack Jemsick? Approve. Doug Marshall? Approve. Janet McGowan? Approve. I barely hear you. Janet? Approve. Okay, thank you. And Christine Gray Mullen, approved. So that's uh, 600. Uh, Mr. Sparkle, are you still there? I want to thank you and um, Amherst Media.
for all your hard work. It's been and a pleasure working with the town. Thank you very much. And Chris, thank you for the history as well. Great. Good luck. And uh, we're, we are very indebted um, as a town to Amherst Media. They do a lot for the town. So I I'm pleased for them that they can um, start to move forward with this because I do think there'll be a lot of benefits for the town as a whole. And with that, I think we can um, move on to uh, our next item. Thank you. Uh, we're, great, thank you. And um, we're gonna go to item four, which is old business uh, and number, oh yeah, okay, number one, zoning, review priorities list for zoning amendments. And Pam, if I can request for you to put up um, Yep. that the old uh, uh, 2019. Um, so I just want to sort of premise yep. this where we're at. This is um, an old table that has been, and I'm going to turn it over to um, Maria Chow, who um, is the chair of the zoning subcommittee and probably has the most history with this, but, um, and she can go into this table. I, I was surprised when I dove deep, um, kind of how out of date and confusing it kind of is. Um, the end goal, what I'm hoping for tonight is for us to come up with sort of a top hits of requests, suggestions to town council and our planning uh, department staff on of all this stuff, and you know, there's a lot. Um, and I asked the board to all kind of come with their top three in their own head, and then we can kind of compile them. And um, because that list will go to Chris Bestrup, and it will go to Rob uh, Mora, our building commissioner, and it will also go to CRC because everybody's trying to do this right now and come up with prioritization. And this will um, be compiled into a bigger effort. So, um, and then hearing from town council what, what they think they want to, um, how they want to attack it in a, in a prioritization level. So, <clears throat> I'm going to turn over to Maria. Are you there, Maria? And maybe you can talk yeah. about this a little bit and what you're thinking. Yeah, just a tiny bit because I think most of the existing planning board members have seen this for years now. And um, basically, the short history of it is that it was created by the last zoning subcommittee, Greg Stutzman, Rob Crowner, and I, and with Chris Brestoff's help, of course, where um, we took literally over a decade's worth of notes, town meeting articles, and um, issues that the planning department had been dealing with and tried to call it down to the big picture priorities. There's a whole bunch of other smaller, more specific technical issues that then we compiled into a just like a word document, but this is sort of big picture. And it was good we reviewed it for today's agenda because I realized we, as a zoning subcommittee, have put our own, <laughs> when we organize it, we already prioritize things before we even gave a chance for other people to prioritize it in that we prioritize the five top columns, you see, housing, downtown, village centers, and zoning bylaw repair and overhaul. We've already said like, those are the five priorities. And then under each one, we then said, here are our objectives or strategies to improve each of those five priorities. So um, I could see how this chart was a little confusing because it, it's already kind of setting a tone. So um, yeah, I'm really curious to hear what other planning board members think are sort of their big sort of red button kind of things they really want to get to. And I appreciated Michael's focus on housing. I, I share that sort of passion in creating a more diverse stock for Amherst. And um, so I guess, you know, if we, you know, whether you want to rewrite this whole chart or just have a sort of list of 10 items, I'm up for, you know, however you guys want to organize it. But um, this is basically a collection of a lot of issues from decades of work that the town has done. So um, yes, it's outdated. And um, there's a lot of things that are a little too specific maybe for what we want to present to town council, but um, I'd like to hear more people's uh, response to this. Um, Greg actually did so many presentations of this chart and I was there for all of them and I cannot do what he did where he literally went through every single one and explained the history and the reason why it's on this chart. And I can't do that. I am 
just not mentally capable of doing that. Maybe Chris Presto can, but I'm not sure we need to do that right now. I think I would just like to hear what other people, what their sort of priorities are. Um, I did have a chance to read Michael's and it was really useful, but um, yeah, I'd like to just open up and see what other people's, um, you know, priorities are and um, to not necessarily follow this chart, but just to use it as like a, as a springboard to, you know, other ideas. That's a good way of saying it. This is a great framework that can springboard to that list that we want to forward. Exactly. Um, you know, can we find agreement on, um, you know, I, I'm thinking somewhere between seven, max 10, you know, we don't want to make too long of a, like a whole unrealistic, but maybe thinking about is, is town council moves forward and, and um, over the next year, I know uh, their elections are, oh, Chris, maybe you can help me. Is that October of this year or November of this year? When do they have their elections? Does anyone remember? Because I know they want to make their dent. They want to start taking action on this. So if reasonably, if we can sort of keep it to, what are we highly recommending in a perfect world, what they could sort of get done um, in the next well, I guess it's about a year and a half or a little shy of that. Um, Chris, I see your hand and then Doug's. I just wanted to acknowledge that Doug had sent me an email that I didn't get a chance to post on the website. So I didn't circulate it to you, but he did list several things that he thought were important priorities and I'm sure he'll present them himself, but I wanted to apologize to him for that. And I, um, I did manage to post Michael's um, in email and chart because that was received a little bit earlier. I think that was received last week. So those are two uh, board members that I heard from and I have my own list of priorities, but I can save those for, um, for later. And uh, so that's all I, I wanted to say. Well, Chris, maybe as we're kind of, I'll use the word grinding through this and establishing our list, um, you know, what you're thinking might help if we're having difference of opinions on um, what people are thinking is reasonable to attack first or whatever. So please speak up if, if we're sort of headed down the wrong path. Um, I also uh, think we should, and this is, we can determine, I was thinking we give them the list and we say we don't, like it's not weighted or prioritized, we feel they're all equal or Keep in mind, maybe we could say, you know, we could number like the first three and then not number the rest. You know, you know what I think you're, I'm saying. So think about how we're presenting it to them, too. Um, and, and we could incorporate a memo with it. You know, Chris could do that also, um, explaining some of our thinking if, if so needed. So, um, Chris, uh, Doug, no, Chris, I see hands popping up and down. <laughs> Doug. Uh, well, I, I put my hand down when I thought Chris was going to read what I sent her. But, <laughs> but, uh, and, and since I don't actually have that email available at the moment, I'll, I'll, I'll try to remember what I sent. And Chris, please correct me. Um, it seemed to me that when I essentially got uh, the charge to, or I guess it was somehow the invitation to be on the on the planning committee uh, focused on uh, improving the vitality of downtown. So it seemed to me that we really ought to be focusing on downtown. I know there's a the master plan envisioned multiple village centers, but I think we ought to start downtown and fix downtown before we uh, just, uh, spread our efforts out in other areas. So I was suggesting that we uh, work on the, the actual physical zone and the dimensional requirements for the BG zone and the BL zone. And um, I think my third uh, was to do with clarification of mixed use uh, buildings. And then uh, I think I, what I said to Chris was that if she thought that the BL and B uh, and BG zones were really one conversation, uh, that my 
alternate third item would be uh, the reformatting of the bylaw. Um, the recodification. Yeah, I mean, I've spent a fair amount of time looking at the Newton, Massachusetts zoning mm -hmm. bylaw because mm -hmm. um, I figure they're a well-run town with lots of resources and if anybody can do it right, it's probably them. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it looks a lot different than ours. And, um, you know, it seems uh, like a model worth following, but I'm sure there's others as well. I'll stop there. Thank you. I also watch um, Arlington, Massachusetts. Theirs is, has some really good stuff and they've been redoing it. So I'm sure Rob Moore and Chris are looking at these too. Um, does anyone have any comments? Those are really good starting points, Doug. I like the um, breaking it out like first downtown and then doing some bullets under it on specifics to that, which I heard you say BG dimensional, uh, BL dimensional um clarification to the mixed use i also want to just toss out there if anyone's thinking inclusionary zoning is very complicated but maybe it could just be focused um for downtown and design guidelines are another thing for downtown um so i see michael's hand yes um pam could you put up this the uh um mm -hmm. this, this the uh chart that I sent in. I see several other charts on the on the, the, the other on the page. Is there a comparison chart? There, the, well, we got this one that I believe came from Jack. Okay. And then so then I took this one. And oh, this slide isn't that terrific because I squeezed it in. And then okay. these two um, I, I just didn't I, know what all those others were. Um, yeah, that's what it is. So okay. this one I, is yours, Michael. Okay, I could, I'd be happy to talk about mine for a second. Uh, <clears throat> I, my sense, I, when I looked through the chart <clears throat> that was sent to us in the um, <clears throat> in the packet, um, it, it seemed extremely redundant in several different categories. Uh, Form-based code was mentioned in several different under, in several columns. The uh, parking was mentioned in several categories, and the mixed use standards were mentioned mentioned in several categories. And I think those are all important. Uh, but I, I, what I did is I combined uh, all those several mentions into one particular category, one particular category. So they're only listed once in the charts that I've I've sent in. Um, I think the most important thing that we need to do is, um, and I'm not sure what exactly. It is, but it has to do with encouraging um, varied and more uh, housing, particularly at the lower end of the scale. Now, whether that's something that needs to go in downtown or in the village centers or both, I'm not so concerned with at this point. So I think I'm, I'm saying that rather than Doug's focus on um, downtown, I think we should focus on housing in its multiple uh, approaches. And one of the issues there is clearly the inclusionary zoning. Uh, another one is uh, the standards and conditions relative to uh, mixed use buildings. So those, those two things, uh, the mixed use building standards and the um, um, development of affordable housing through um, um, the, um, I lost the word, lost the phrasing. Um, uh, inclusionary zoning uh, are the two places where I think we should go and the third and fourth are up to other people. So those are your top three, right? Because there's a lot there, Michael. Say that. So what would be your top three? It's, it's hard to put them. They, they all kind of link together in a lot of ways. And I, I'm not sure that top three is, is really a useful thing. I think working on housing in its multiple incarnations and aspects is what we should be doing uh, and that includes things like uh, mixed use develop mixed use definitions and clarity it includes things like uh, affordable housing uh, uh, and inclusionary includes, zoning and yeah inclusionary zoning and small houses on small lots uh, all the stuff that's basically under the housing column uh, although I'm not sure where the 40 r uh, district planning fall, process falls in that. I don't know where we are relative to that because we haven't been uh, talking about that much and we, have, we supposedly have a, a 
presentation on that at some point in the near future, but it's unclear who's, you know, up, and that's, that's all up in the air. So I haven't listed that as something that I think is important, uh, but I, it's the housing issues for me. For housing, um, would that include, um, you know, two or three families by right? Absolutely. Um, expanding supplemental dwelling? Absolutely. Um, reducing single family zoning only in some yeah, districts. Absolutely. Dis considering all those things. I'm not necessarily advocating all those things, but I'm, I'm advocating that the right. we're talking they're about on them. the list. So yeah. I'm going to call on Maria because this is really Maria's area. Um, so if we can define some of those down, Maria, we can put that on the list um, for people to consider. Yeah, no, that's been something I really had hoped to work on more, but then all this stuff happened um, with uh, COVID and then um, Rob Mora, before COVID was like thinking about zoning bylaw rewrite and so, so was town council. But yeah, I think um, Michael's exactly right. Un I think the key word is unlocking housing because a lot of our parcels just are locked up. They, you know, it's particularly downtown, they're just unable to um, have residential uh, allowed and, um, also, yeah, if we better define mixed use or apartments, we could also, again, unlock the ability to do um, a, a denser, high quantity of housing type. So those are like for, um, so I, I guess to say to town council, one of my priorities would be housing, and then it's basically unlocking the ability to create a diversity of housing stock. But So that's, you know, both apartments and mixed use, which would help vi revitalize downtown. Yeah, I, um, the diversity is the key word there. Exactly, right, right. And so somehow we want to include inclusionary, you know, requirements within that kind of use. Um, then there's the sort of missing middle I keep bringing up in previous meetings where we create the ability for new families to move in, whether it's through infill or um, unlocking the ability of parcels to buy right, have multifamily units or um, supplemental dwell. Well, supplemental dwellings are already buy right, but... Um, Sometimes uh, you need a special permit for certain types. Exactly. So um, just really unlocking the ability for both individual property owners as well as developers to really bring a diversity of housing stock. So I guess the way to phrase that as one big umbrella statement would be good for town council. And then like you were listing off, Christine, all of those are ways to do that. Um, There's so many strategies to do it. And so I think we need to, not say one is a solution we just need to create a toolbox and um i can't say one is a higher priority than the other as far as like the type yeah. of housing but um some of the easier ones might be just unlocking property owners rights um sm you know people being able to put adus and um extra like a duplex or a triplex on property so that requires study. It's not like you can just rewrite it in the zoning and hope for the best. You know, it does require some careful study of our um, residential zones. Um, and then, yeah, looking at downtown as far as how to unlock certain parcels, like um, Doug had mentioned, the BL and BG, where you just simply aren't allowed right now because of the um, lot requirements, lot size requirements. So, um, yeah, housing is my number one, I think because I think that solves a lot of things and brings a lot of things to our town. Um, it, it touches on downtown, it touches on um, some zoning repair that needs to happen. And so, um, so I don't know if we need to like list specific uh, objectives or strategies. I think I would like to just present to town council that housing, creating a diversity of housing stock or unlocking the ability to create a diversity of housing stock would be like my number one. Because that's a really broad umbrella, and so I think it covers a lot of the other issues. Um, downtown is certainly an issue. I think if we can get more housing, more people down there, make it more walkable, that will actually resolve a lot of things. And other things and particularly emphasizing the toolbox aspect of it all. There are many yeah, a diversity of types. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I see a couple more hands just to sort of try to pair this. Um, so what I'm seeing is three evolve with some subcategories because I think su suggesting some tools in the toolbox will be helpful for them because they look to us as the, <laughs> the experts and that, 
you know, we understand all these, these new parts. Um, so I'm seeing downtown and under that, you know, Chris can help us pull this together and then we could review it, you know, for the next meeting. Um, the BG, the BL, um, you know, inclusionary zoning and clarification mixed use, but um, number two is the housing, unlocking the diversity of housing. And there can be suggestions in there about uh, the two or three family, um, you know, by right, ex uh, expanding ADU and supplemental options, um, infill, um, you know, removing the single family only dwelling um, and allowing other um, densification of certain zoning districts. So, and then the third one I see is recodification. Um, and supporting that whole effort. And that, I, I kind of like how, and, and then sort of leaving out the villages is what I'm hearing a little bit. Um, I, I just want to throw out um, downtown, if anyone feels that design guidelines would be helpful in the next year and a half. Um, we do have some drafts to start with from the 40R consultant. Um, and so I'm, at that, I'm throwing it back out, Jack and then Janet. Yeah. yeah, so I agree, um, you know, housing is, is huge, downtown, very important, recodification. Uh, but just looking at um, some of the line items there that, that pop out at me, um, you know, I just, I just, you know, that, that BL zone is so dysfunctional that, that really bugs me that, that we have a zone, you know, in our prescribed, you know, on our bylaws and map that that doesn't work for anyone. Uh, that's embarrassing. Um, and I think in terms of village centers, I, I, I think those are important. I, I think North Amherst is in good shape with the development that's going on there. I think, I mean, I and Atkins Corner is good. Cushman Village, I'm not so sure about. I, I haven't really seen much there, but I, I do think East Amherst and the Pomeroy Village, South Amherst, uh, I think they can, I would not lose sight of those when we're talking about, you know, areas within town when, you know, for example, downtown. Um, and certainly the, the thing that keeps on coming up is the parking requirements. We certainly got to do better there because that comes every, every time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going more than <laughs> my three, but <laughs> I think North, Ham North Amherst Slat Hills Road is like a accident waiting to happen with regard to the reliance on private wells and septics there with such small lots, you know, within a bedrock terrain up there. Uh, that's not, you know, that's going to come back at some point. And so, you know, that's not to be ignored. Very difficult problem. Uh, Hold for up, sure. Jack, for a sec. Like, Pam, can you slide back to the 2019 one? Because this is Michael's, which is good, but it, okay. All right. So where is that hydrology? Oh, all right. It was in the medium under zoning and bylaw yeah. repair. Yeah. And, um, you know, can I, can, that's a good point. Can I ask Chris Bestra, is that something, do you think that would be handled in the recodification or does that need to be a separate thing? I think it can be discussed in the recodification. It's something that probably requires some analysis of a consultant as to what those lots can actually accommodate. Right now, the zoning, I think, is 30,000 square feet um, per lot. It's probably better if it's, you know, more than that. But um, the next step up in our zoning bylaw is 80,000 square feet, which seems kind of beyond what should be required. So it's it's got to have some uh, technical analysis to figure this out. Um, but that's certainly something that, that I think is important. And there is going to be more development up in that area. So you might as well face it and do something about it. And Jack, it just made me, you know, think about this. So Chris, would that be an in-house thing or hire a consultant thing or have to go apply for a grant and get money to do that kind of thing? That would probably be hire a consultant. And um, currently we don't have enough money to do that right now. We have, we only have $40,000 to um, work on downtown um, and gateway rezoning. So that's, you know, the downtown and the area immediately north of downtown or northwest of downtown. Um, we don't really have anything in the budget to um, do other types of um, zoning analysis. So that's something that we would have to ask to 
town council for as part of the capital budget. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if that's going to happen this year or if that's going to happen. Uh, it's probably not going to happen this year because of our uh, financial stresses. So, um, you know, there may be some things that we can, um, some suggestions that we can make for that uh, area, but really to get um, serious about about it, I think we do need to hire uh, uh, someone who knows about um, geology and how septic systems work, et cetera. Um, so that may take a little bit longer than uh, some of the other things which we can handle without hiring a consultant. But Jack, uh, just back to you. So in your professional opinion, because you really know, you do feel that, what did, I forget what you said, not a ticking bomb, but. Uh, it's <laughs> accident waiting to happen. Accident waiting to happen, which is <laughs> kind of funny. It's about sewer. So yeah, septic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Accident. Yeah. yeah. It's like that. All yeah, right. Just the watering of the area because of the density, you know, with private wells mm -hmm. on small lots like that, you know, so, uh, you know, we, so it's we, important to be on the list, but yeah, but not certainly necessarily it's not the top three. year and a half. Yeah. It's not the top three. Okay. And then, uh, I, you know, I would like my, you know, I, and I don't understand it, but I like my, you know, make my pitch for the form, form based code, whatever that is. It sounds great. Uh, <laughs> I just, uh, so much of the, of the, the, the code we're looking at is just seems so arbitrary. Um, so, um, that's my two cents. Thank you, Janet. And then I see Maria's hand. Um, I, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Oh, good. Um, so I'm kind of, kind of lost in process. And so I know that we've agreed um, to work with Rob Mora, who's working on a rewrite of the zoning bylaw. And he was talking about working very closely with the zoning subcommittee and the planning board for direction. And then, you know, hiring consultants consultants for issues downtown, parking, and different, you know, probably form-based zoning issues, I would guess. And we have the master plan, which has an implementation matrix that has a lot of zoning changes on it. We have the housing production plan, which has a ton of recommendations for zoning and also kinds of changes. The Amherst housing market study, same thing. And the open space and recreation plan, which I think is still a draft, but also has recommendations in terms of action items needed to protect um, and buffer, you know, farmlands and, and recreational lands and, and open space. And so I'm kind of completely lost about how, like, the town council, I just don't understand what we're doing tonight because I feel like we have a lot of plans. We have a lot of recommendations. The zoning subcommittee had a last year was working on multi-use buildings, we're starting to talk about affordable housing, inclusion zoning requirement across the town, which is part of the recommendations of those two housing things. So I just don't understand how, like the town, like what are they coming to us for? Like taking, you know, 75 recommendations and what's our top five? And are they gonna be doing zoning changes with Rob Mora and the planning board and the zoning? Are they just gonna propose, do you know what I mean? Like how do we coordinate all this? and? You know, and how will we work with neighborhoods and business people and the public in terms of getting support for these changes and so they can understand and have input in the process. So I'm just kind of lost here about what we're doing. I mean, I could give you my, my you know, my top hit is inclusionary zoning across the board, every neighborhood, every project, you know, special permit site plan review, 10 or more residential units, any which way, any permit. Um, let's just get that job done. It's very, you know, and, but I, but you know, and the housing is the, you know, behemoth of our town because we're basically a, a resident, a residential community for, you know, UMass and um, others. So I, I don't, I don't get it. Like, do you know what I'm saying? I just don't get it. I mean, if we're going to do form based zoning and say to the town council, oh, why don't you do some form based zoning? That's a massive project. And how do, how do they work with Rob Mora and us on getting there? I mean, do they have, are they, I mean, what do they want from us kind of thing? And how, how can we work together? Am I? So I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, but what they're looking for is a short list of what we as the planning board and semi-professionals would re recommend for them to start tackling for the next year and a half. Now that doesn't mean they're, 
they're going to listen to us, they could completely pick a different list or, oh, or the planning department could have a slightly different list. But it's giving them a starting point because CRC will be their guiding group um, to get the town council to decide what they think they will first pursue over the next year and a half. And then they will tell us that and we will assist them and work with them and the planning department to get those things done. So this is our moment to speak, to say what we feel is important and realistically trying to give them a short list of what we think they should do. Oh. So for top three, as I said, everyone should bring their top three. I heard you say inclusionary zoning and I heard you say, you know, the housing stock increasing that. Um, do you have any other top things that you would like them to work on or is that it? Um, I, I think I, I, you know, I, I do have more ideas, but um, I, I wonder if we need to, so are, is town council going to be working with Rob Mora or on a separate line or, I mean, I, I, I see this, I need, I, mean, I mentioned this before, I think we need someone on the planning board of the zoning subcommittee working as liaison to CRC, kind of open those lines of communications. I just, you know, I could look at this list or the 75 recommendations and give you my top 10 or five, but are, tonight, are we gonna come up with a top three to give to the, to the town council, regardless of what Rob Moore is working on? Or Rob I'm Moore is working on the recodification, which is its own separate thing that is based on him working with the bylaws in uh, inconsistencies, adjusting the framework so it's easier to read and understand. It hasn't been reworked in decades and aligning with current building codes. Like that's his thing, that's his specialty, that's what he'll be working on. And then he will be presenting it in parts, I'm sure, to planning board, CRC and town council. Then there's the other part we're talking about like inclusionary zoning, that would be more under the planning department and Chris, and she would either be working on drafting bylaw or if there's more resources needing, needed like um, a consultant, well, town council has the power to get the funds to get whatever they need to get it done. We don't. So, um, and list wise, I said for everyone to bring their top three because I figured by the time we finish compiling this, it will be more like seven to 10. But like I said, we don't want to send everybody's top 10. We'll end up with like this chart, like 70 things. And then that's not really helpful to them. They are looking for what are they going to work on for the next year and a half. I think one of those things is the recodification, but what other things can we put on the list as heavy suggestions as they look to us as experts as a recommendation for them to start figuring out that process. And we still do our role and have our public meetings and interact with the public, you know, as these bylaws roll out. It's just different than it used to be with town meeting and the zoning subcommittee and that kind of thing that doesn't really work anymore. So, so when when he talked to us, he was saying, talking about, you know, the issues of the downtown requiring a consultant and direction from the planning board. Um, and it wasn't just like I'm doing the recodification, but like more substantive issues and things like that. So I thought it was like a deeper process than what you're describing now, based on what he was saying. So I think he so, was just giving us a basic I, what he kind of thought. Nothing was written in stone. And a lot of what he was talking about isn't in, isn't really his jurisdiction. It would be Chris Vestrup's. I, I guess I just was it. I, I just got a completely. We talked for an hour. We had a long discussion about the whole redoing of the bylaw, and it wasn't just moving sections around. Anyway, I, I'm just lost on the process and how to kind of work together. And I wonder if we need a liaison to the CRC to kind of open up the discussion and things like that. So, I will. Be well, quiet for a while. It's and the other way. CRC back. has a liaison to us. They, they don't have anybody now. They plan to. So. And that's how it was before, but the players have changed on CRC, but they'll have a new rep that will be the liaison with us. Well, I wonder if planning board members feel like we should have somebody too. 
Um, so that said, um, I would put village centers, I think we've kind of neglected them and that's a big priority and a, a source of economic development for the town. Um, like keeping, you know, bringing in more more housing to them that, in a way that people want to go to them and, and can actually walk from business to business. With so I think that village center planning is really important. And there's been a lot of focus on the downtown. I think that that would be a very long process. Um, you know, questions about building heights, density, um, the BL, I don't know if it's broken or we can just redo the BL or make it into village business village center for more flexibility. Um, you know, part of the brokenness of the BL is just that it's broken up into small, you know, property ownership, but there are owners who are combining and they have more flexibility. There's also some really nice buildings in the BL. I would jump on the parking issue. It just seems completely, I don't know what we're doing on parking. And I think it really affects, I think there shouldn't be a no parking district downtown because everybody in those buildings and apartments need parking. Um, you know, the mixed use building standards, I think, tie in very closely to the apartment complexes. I would push for greater density at where we already have it, which is, you know, apartment complexes and like see if we can get better design and more um, amenities for people and also increase the density of it. Um, I, I, the 40R is not my favorite because I, I just don't, I think that whole pro, I think, I just think we need to involve the neighbors and businesses in, in the processes before we kind of pop on a big form based zoning. Um, and then, you know, we, we the, a lot of the master plan talks about sort of protecting open space and recreational areas and buffer zones for farmlands. And so I think we should look at those other sides, not just always, you know, increasing density and housing. So if we develop our village centers, we also need to protect our open lands and our farmlands and recreational lands. So I would look at those two as kind of a balanced type of thing. Um, and then inclusionary affordable housing, we just have to do it across across developments. Thank you. I see Maria, then Doug, then Jack. Um, hmm. uh, someone said something that trigger uh it might have been jack who mentioned form based code and the reason why you guys picked up on this there's a lot of repetition in this um chart from last year is that every time under each column there was a strategy or solution that could help that column we put it there and so that's why form based code shows up i think in all of them and it's something that would just solve so much but it's a huge undertaking it would take way too much money that we don't have right now but that's just something to put in the back of their minds the town council's minds that you know one day when we do have the funds for it that would resolve so much of the issues happening downtown so many of the con yeah the conflicts that are going on the really controversial issues form-based zoning form-based zoning is like the solution to all our prayers i mean it really <laughs> is it's just we can't you know handle some a task that monumental right now um, the other thing that um, Janet was talking about that I don't know if we should get into this right now, Christine, or not, but about the process and the zoning subcommittee in particular, because right now I'm hearing a lot of feedback that town council, Rob Mora, the planning staff, they're all sort of figuring out this process about zoning, fixing, zoning rewrite, zoning issues, zoning amendments. And in my mind, as zoning subcommittee chair, I don't think that at this point the zoning subcommittee needs to exist. There are too many cooks in the kitchen that actually make the decisions and um, know zoning better than the zoning subcommittee. <laughs> I, I'm speaking for myself. Um, I'm with you. So, so I really, I mean, we can talk about it when we do the subcommittee update, but it's kind of tied into this. We're trying to step out of the process as individuals and work more with like the bigger entities that are just the decision makers and have them work with the planning board because there's really great people on the planning board who all have really great ideas and experience. We should work more with them rather than creating yet another small subcommittee that's throwing around ideas that has no say so in anything. And not only that, it's, it's a huge load on the planning staff as far as getting ready for yet another committee meeting um, that happens twice a month. So I just want to throw that in there that the reason, another reason why we're giving all this feedback to town council is because they're the decision makers. They're the ones who are going to lead this charge and priorities as far as how we 
you know, make Amherst a better place to live, work, you know, be. And so, um, yeah, I think they, they want feedback from the planning board because we've been doing this for a little while and we have come across the same sort of issues and they just want to hear from us, you know, what are the planning priorities that are in our mind? And um, so, yeah, I, I think we're hearing a lot about housing downtown and then the whole zoning rewrite or bylaw repair, whatever, I think that's a separate trajectory. We don't know what's going on with that yet, but that might actually fix a lot of the issues we're talking about right now. But the bigger bites, I think, are downtown and housing as far as um, if town council wanted to think about other things to try to prioritize um, focusing on because zoning, the zoning bylaw issue is, um, I think that's another animal in itself. So, um, so I just want to throw that out there, Janet, because you had mentioned the zoning subcommittee and I think it needs to dissolve. I dug up this email from Wayne Fiden from <laughs> last year because we had talked to Carolyn Mish and um, I know that Chris had talked to or emailed with Wayne Fiden about like, what do you guys do as far as zoning? Uh, how do you make zoning changes? And Northampton does not have a zoning subcommittee. They start zoning changes from the planning staff. It goes to um, refer to the, the planning board and then the planning board talks or works with the city council, which then refers it back to the planning staff. So they really have a smaller circle as far as their process on how all this happens. So, um, so I just wanna throw that in there, even though we're gonna maybe talk about it later. But um, yeah, I think the planning boards have a bigger sort of, um, you know, involvement in in, in um, thinking about zoning bylaw and uh, zoning bylaw amendments and that the zoning subcommittee is a thing of the past. <laughs> it's a, it was good when it w was around because it, you know, started this sort of um, back when um, I think a few members wanted it who actually wrote zoning bylaws. Um, but uh, I think we're not at that capacity now. And um, yeah, there's too many cooks in the kitchen. So that's just my two cents. Thank you. I recognize Jack, then I see Michael, Doug, and Janet. And just to remind everyone, um, we've got a lot of good stuff here. So um, add some more comments. Uh, my plan is that Chris can develop uh, a, you know, a draft of our list and then it will be reviewed at the next planning board meeting on the 19th, which um, then hopefully there would be a vote and it could then be moved forward to uh, the planning department, CRC, and the town council. So we've got a lot of good stuff here. So Jack. Yeah, so, you know, I definitely agree with Marie about the zoning subcommittee. It seemed like its function was kind of interfacing with town meeting and, and the education process with how to deliver complex information to many people of varying levels of, of uh, uh, you know, technical sort of know-how and, and how to process. And, and that's not the case now, I don't think with, with, the, with the CRC and town council, they just, it's just, it's a lot more, you know, efficiency that they're, they're working with the town much better and that all makes sense to me, so. Just wanted to say that. And then uh, with regard to um, the lay, you know, functions of liaisons from the planning board, I go back to, I feel like we're, we're not elected people, we're just appointed. <laughs> and, then, and, and then when we send people to these different you know, committees, like I'm on the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, I mean, I, I'm very reluctant to make you know decisions that really have a bearing on on Amherst, but really that really never really comes up in my in my role there. It did come up when we were electing the uh, the new director for the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and, and uh, all of a sudden there was a lot of attention to Pioneer Valley Planning Commission in terms of who I was going to vote for, and and all this intense is like wow, people. Uh, so I, I realize, like the planning board people, when when we're representing on different committees, uh, or or we're a liaison, that we represent the whole planning board, and and so I get nervous when we have one individual that would be that liaison communicating for all of us. So I just I'd rather have the CRC 
come to us, like, like Christine mentioned, seems like a much more healthy model. Uh, because again, I, I feel like we're more in an advisory role. And, and the last, I, I don't want to pick on anyone, but uh, I think I heard everybody needs parking downtown. Uh, not true. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you. I see Michael Burt whistle. Yeah. Um, in line with uh, Christine's hope for a, uh, a top three or a top five, I would I want to suggest that we've got a top three, and that is uh, housing, and it's multiple in its multiple um, uh, incarnations with the, the toolbox idea. Downtown, and the uh, ultimate repair and replacement of the zoning bylaw. Uh, and if we submit those three ideas to CRC and then to the, the council, I think that will include almost most, most of the things that we're interested in working on. It doesn't leave every, doesn't put everything in. It leaves the, the Flathills issue and the water issue out. It leaves the marijuana cultivation, cultivation out. It leaves several things out that were on the list. But I think for me, those are the, those are the really important things. And all the stuff we talk about on a regular basis, whether it's form-based zoning or zoning repair or fixing the parking bylaw or any of those kind of bylaw tinkerings or, cha or big changes, you know, you put it under the, under the category of bylaw revision and or uh, 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 redoing. And the same thing is true with the downtown issues. And the same thing is true with the housing issues. Well, they all overlap to some degree. Uh, and that's why that all those uh, items showed up in all the different categories in the 19 in the 2019 chart because they do they all overlap and they all fit in one place or another. But if we focus them the way I'm suggesting, I think it makes more sense. It's more understandable to the CRC and to the town council. But these are the things that the planning board is interested in working on, and uh, uh, we hope they are too. Agree. Sounds good, Michael. Um, so at this point, um, Chris, uh, can you and I sort of work together and get a draft out um, and send that out to members so, and then put it on the agenda for the next meeting to um, finalize? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, you know, this is sort of our creative process here and it's fluid and, and um, I think we'll do a good job and get a good list and I think it will be helpful. So thank you everyone for um, you're looking at this. So um, at this point, I'm going to suggest we move forward. Uh, Chris, were there any other old business topics not reasonably anticipated? I can't oh, think of any. I just saw, uh, you can't think of any? Okay. Um, Michael, I'll, I see your hand up. Yeah, I don't know whether this is old business or new business. In any event, it's not, not anticipated 48 hours of the meeting. <laughs> Uh, I was driving today by the uh, up Spring Street, and I noticed the uh, building at uh, 26, is it 26 Spring Street, uh, and I realized that it's been uh, sitting there with nothing having been done to it for at least four months now, um, and uh, I wonder if that's an issue for us uh, or for anybody that, that I, I wonder, I'm wondering about it. Uh, did they... Other other buildings are complete are continuing in spite of the pandemic. Uh, that one is not. I guess it's the pandemic. I, I, have they run out of money? Are we going to have to repurpose that site? What's going on, Chris? I do not know what's going on. I've heard conjectures from various people, but I don't have any facts, so uh, I don't. I uh, can't really. I can't really help to enlighten us about that one. <laughs> I've noticed that myself, Michael. So it's, it's somewhat concerning that that building might just stay that way for 15 years unless we do something about it. And that really strikes me as a bad idea. Anyway, just brought it up. Thanks. Uh, item five, new business topics not reasonably anticipated. Anything? 
Uh, we don't have any new business as far as I know. Maybe Pam has something, but not I do not. And Janet, did you have something to say? I saw her hand pop up, but now it's gone. But we'll just raise it again if you have something. Okay. Um, um, okay. So, and I don't see Pam. Pam's working there. Uh, okay. I number. Wait, yeah, no, I have nothing. Okay. Um, item six, Form A, A and R subdivision applications. We do have a Form A. Yep. And Pam, oh. I'm going to show you where it is. She's got a, a map here. Um, this here is you go, Chris. Here's your map. Tom Reedy has submitted this um, A&R application. And so the uh, property that's outlined here in yellow is 10 Cortland Drive. And the gentleman who owns this property also owns the adjacent property, which is outlined in turquoise. And he wants to um, reconfigure these properties so that he... Um, I think he probably wants to sell the turquoise property. So he submitted an ANR plan, which Pam might um, now show us. And um, so lot one is the lot on the left where the uh, house is currently located. I might add that this um, property uh, on top of the drawing here that looks like it's got bricks on it, um, that is also a property that's owned by this fellow. I think, I'm not sure what his name is, Schneeze, Schneeweiss or something like that. Um, anyway, so he owns this uh, property with the house on it. He owns the property with the brick pattern on it. And he owns this property um, to the right side of the drawing, which is called lot two. Yeah. Um, he wants to reconfigure the property line between lots one and two. Um, and so he can accommodate the building circle on both properties and also meet the setback requirements because you can see that there's a dotted line that runs very close to his house. Uh, maybe Pam can show where that is. This line here, yep, that's existing lot line and that's too close to the house. And it also puts this little shed, this little square um, striped thing between the two properties. If you can go up to the top, that, that yep. thing there. It puts that, I think that's actually called a cabin. Um, so that would have been on lot two. And Mr. Schneeweiss wants to have that little cabin on his own property where the house is and also have the appropriate setbacks um, to that cabin. And the cabin does have the appropriate setbacks in this drawing. And the deck also has the appropriate setback. The deck is, um, I think it's, four feet high. And so it's set back a distance. No, it's three feet high. So it's set back a distance equal to its height. Um, so Rob Mora has examined this drawing closely and it meets the zoning requirements. And the um, town engineer has also examined this closely and he recommended that there be an easement, which is um, the kind of hatched area that's shown down closer to the road, that area there, which would be a sewer easement that would allow the sewer in Cortland Drive to serve both lot two and lot one. Um, so that's that's why that sewer easement is drawn there. So Mr. Reedy would have been here, except that he needed to be in Uxbridge at a zoning board of appeals meeting um, tonight. So he wasn't able to be here, but he did uh, ask that we present this drawing to you this ANR and ask if you would authorize the um, planning board chair to sign it. I'm good. Does uh, anyone have an issue with me signing? Raise your hand. If there's any questions? I'm not seeing any hands, so I think um, I think we're good, Chris. Okay. So I'll get the drawings together and I'll let you know when um, when they're all together, and uh, ask you to come in and sign them, Christine. Great, thank you. Uh, item seven, upcoming ZBA applications. I don't have anything new to tell you. Um, they're still, still um, taking on the comprehensive permit for 132 Northampton Road, um, and they will be meeting again tomorrow night. Okay, Is thank there, you. There's something that just came in, Pam, last week that we put into Munis. What was that? You helped Maureen to put it into Munis. 
Remember what that was? Yes, that that's the appeal for. That's right. Yep. So that's that's the appeal, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But I thought everybody knew about that. Yes. Right. So item um, eight, upcoming SPPS PR SUV sub applications. The one thing that I'm aware of is that um, Survival Center is coming in. Uh, they um, are trying to serve their population um, and not allowing anyone to come into their building. And right now they have a tent in their parking lot. And um, because, you know, winter is coming on, uh, they want to have a more um, secure building or temporary building that is capable of withstanding snow and also, um, you know, is a little warmer than just having a tent. So um, because the workers from the survival center have to be in this building and serve the people who come for food or whatever they're coming for. Um, so anyway, they want to propose a, a structure that they're describing as a a temporary structure and they're sometimes they talk about it as being a shed so they're going to be coming to you on the 2nd of September um, to make this proposal and I've been working with the um, with Lev Ben Ezra on the application for that um, so you'll be seeing that and and Pam I don't can't think of anything else that we have coming before the planning board can you no Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll move to item uh, nine, planning board uh, committee and liaison reports. Um, so Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, Jack. Uh, I, I believe there's you know, a quote unquote recess uh, going on right now. Um, not sure when we're meeting next, but uh, it's been quiet. Are they no do you know if they're going to do Zoom meetings or? Oh, we've been doing Zoom meetings, but okay. uh, you know that was, uh, geez, I can't remember when the last one was. Definitely in June. I'm not sure we did one in July. So it's summer, uh, summer. Yeah. Days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So probably get started up September time. Um, Community Preservation Act Committee. Uh, nothing to report there or for the design review board. Um, so before we move on to zoning subcommittee, I just, um, I just, Jack, do you know how many years you've been on Pioneer Valley Planning Commission? Uh, let's see, when did I start? Like four years ago? Four years ago. Yeah. So four years, I'm just, and, um, and you have now moved up to the level that you're also on their executive committee. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And with um, my moving on, that will open up a slot for someone else on the planning board to be the alternate commissioner, if they would like to, to keep that in mind. Um, the agricultural commission, David was on, that is also open. And um, Michael, how many years have you been on the uh, CPAC and the Design Review Board? I've been on the Design Review Board for three years and CPAC for two. For two, okay. So I'm just asking because, um, you know, in the past, um, usually members rotate a little bit, try different committees, and I want the other members, and there'll be new members coming on, um, to fill those spots, but where you guys are the existing members, if, if, you know, this is a good time to sort of reconsider or move, um, like, um, with the, uh, if the zoning subcommittee goes away, um, you know, Michael, like you have two big ones there, you may not want both, um, and other members might want to chant, you know, those are two of the pretty powerful ones. Um, and so just keep in mind that other committee members might you know, want to shuffle a little on one of those. So think about which one you like the most or something. Well, you um, have to give up either or both of them. Well. Nobody wants them. Well, and that's the point. I think so um, we'll have over the, about a month from now, hopefully you'll be getting some, a couple of new members. Um, elections would happen, you know, the board votes. Um, so just, I'll give it a little thought, um, you know, and if other members do want, that um, they might speak up 
But Michael, I guess what I'm saying is maybe if you have a preference for one um, that you might want to make that known so that people know that like that one you like more than the other one or whatever. Or, or maybe you like them both the same. Um, I'm just tossing that out because, you know, just to rotate it around. Um, so um, I'll move on to zoning subcommittee and um, Christine. Yes. Doug, Doug Marshall. Oh, Doug. Sorry. Thank you. Didn't see your hand. Thank you. Doug? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to know all of you guys that are liaisons, uh, what does that involve? <laughs> do you go to every meeting of that entity or do you call the chair once every two months or you know what what's the level of commitment involved the level of commitment is you are expected to attend the meetings of those um, boards or commissions or committees um, that is the expectation so it is an added um, uh, duty to your normal planning board. Um, so it is a commit, you know, a commitment and some people just don't have the bandwidth and that's okay. They're not on any of the committees. Um, but, um, you know, we used to have some additional ones on there, but the, the list is shrinking, which is kind of good because there's already so many demands on us. So, um, so like I said, when you have new members coming in, this is when you might all want to look at this with the chair. Christine, in response to uh, yes. Doug's uh, comment, uh, in terms of the Design Review Board and the Community Preservation Act Committee, uh, we're not liaisons, we're members of those committees. Uh, not that it makes any real difference, but they're voting members. Well, it and makes a huge difference. Uh, CPAC also is a voting member. So the only, and correct. Impartial commit, I don't, Chris, do you know if on the Ag Committee uh, Commission, do you vote as a member or you just, um, <laughs> I think it's a liaison. Did so that I, one's a liaison and the other ones are members. Right. Mm -hmm. The design review board, the CPAC, and um, the Piner Valley mm -hmm. vote. Uh, Janet? Janet? She's muted. But um, he's also frozen. I'm You're frozen, Janet. And muted. Okay, I'm moving. <laughs> All right, can you unmute me then, somebody? Um, yeah, I I've, can. I've been trying to. Yeah, you're frozen. So, um, let's but, it's in, but it's interesting. I was just able to oh, clear. I think she might be good now. Yep. Yeah, your Wi-Fi is just, are you in a basement or something? No, because it's like wherever you are usually, no problem. But tonight, a lot of, lot of issues. Janet, you're on, yeah, you're just, from, you're going to have to go bye-bye and try um, logging in again. Okay, I'm going to assume that she's going to close out and then log back in. Um, Maria, oh, mm -hmm. no other hands. Maria, do you want to talk about zoning subcommittee? Yeah, just briefly, but also maybe when we get new members, it'd be great if whoever's on current committees just talks about like number of meetings a month and commitment and what it's like, because I have no idea what the other commitments are for the other boards. Um, but yeah, as far as zoning subcommittee, I already mentioned, it's just a now defunct group. I mean, especially with you going, Christine, It'd just be Janet and I, and even if we had 10 people on the board, it just still doesn't make sense. Uh, sorry, the subcommittee, because um, there's uh, a lot of other heads sort of going, coming together to work on zoning rewrite. So um, I don't know, do we have to vote to nullify it or can we just dissolve it? I don't know if there's a formal process we need to do, but um, yeah, I think the zoning subcommittee is a no longer needed. Um, there are other towns that had it when they had big things going on, like uh, master planning or uh, other big initiatives, but um, now the ball's in someone else's court. So um, yeah, Chris, do you know if we need to do some sort of formal thing to say zoning subcommittee is no longer a... I think you pro probably should to take a formal action. 
Years ago, they took a vote to create it, so Ooh. we would take a vote to end it. Um, so can I make a motion to <laughs> dissolve the zoning subcommittee? And can I interrupt you all? Janet McGowan has left the meeting. Oh. Just, just so you know, you know that. I mean, I have noted it here in the minutes, no. but I have no idea if she's trying to come back. Okay. Um, so I suggest we don't make the motion until Janet comes back. Yeah, she she's a committee back. member, so yeah, it would yeah. make sense. But that's the general sense of the direction of that subcommittee. It's just, it's no longer useful. I agree, and I just, as someone who's been on it. Uh, I wonder if this, if she has called in. <laughs> oh. Can we ask this person who they are? I bet it's Janet, because it's brand new. It's me. Bring her in. I mean, I'm yeah. just listening. Just keep going, guys. I'm just going to hang out oh. here. Okay. <laughs> well, Janet, we were just saying that the zoning subcommittee is no longer really a useful entity because there's other bigger groups making decisions. And so we're talking about uh, making a formal motion or vote to no longer have that subcommittee. Do you know, I, I, I would actually strongly object to that because it's not on the agenda. And I'm in the vice chair of the committee and I haven't heard about it, but it seems you know like it's been talked about by others. And um, I think maybe we should push this to September to sort of discuss because yeah, I, I people I think people need to refresh a little bit of what Rob Moore was talking about in terms of his, who he was planning on working with. I was also going to suggest that we all talk maybe in September as a planning board about how we're going to implement the master plan and the master plan implementation committee we had been talking about months ago. So I, I don't think that, you know, at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock on a meeting throwing us in at the end is kind of a seems just seems really out of order to me. I, well, I mean, I'm on this committee and, and I just, I, I could see a role for it. I'd like to talk about it and think about it and talk to the committee members, not hear that like, oh, it's not important. Let's get rid of it. Well, the committee members would be you and me. And um, like I mentioned before, right now there's too many things going on for the planning department to really put more energy and time into yet another bi-monthly meeting that isn't really going to be achieving much because the town well, can we talk about this could we talk about this when it's on the agenda in a more kind of thoughtful way and yeah. you know, put it off for two weeks or a month or so i mean we're not going to meet anyway so no, we're not and maybe meet. some maybe I mean, there might be some members on the board now or in the future be interested in re, you know revitalizing it i certainly am I guess it's, it, it's a, yeah, we can definitely discuss it later. It makes sense too. But I also want to just have you put, think in your thought process, think about the planning staff as well than their time. So uh, yeah, we can discuss it more, but also consider that as a reason to not have it. So, um, so give that some thought. Um, I could put together a memo or a list of things to send to Chris Breastrup to then circulate as reasons why the Sony subcommittee is defunct. And then we can talk about it at a later meeting, but. Um, sure, I, I just think it's sort of, it seems to be, I'm kind of completely surprised by this. And. Um, I have to say, Janet, I've mentioned it to you. Um, well, you, you actually mentioned it to me on a phone call as a done deal, which makes me wonder if you have been talking with <laughs> others about it. I don't understand this process. It, it's I don't get not it. a done deal, but I did talk to you about it. Um, I'm on the committee also, Michael, I do see it. I'm, I'm on the committee, Maria's on the committee, and um, I think all the reasons why Maria has mentioned that this is not a good use of our time, it's, it's no longer, it doesn't fit. Hey, well, let's just, let's just follow thing. for a moment, open meeting law, Hold and on, just put Janet, it on Janet, for, and Let me just finish, and I also agree that it's, I want Chris Bestrup to have time to write zoning bylaws, not be preparing for yet another meeting where nothing really gets accomplished. I want her to be writing the zoning bylaws and bringing them to the planning board. But I, I hear you, I, I, and that, you know, you don't want it to be dissolved and you are a member and I think we wanna hear reasons, you know, specific reasons why you think it needs to 
keep going. But before you do that, think about for a minute, I want to call Michael has been very patiently uh, with a raised hand. I also see Chris Bestrup. So I'm going to have Michael talk, then Chris, and then Janet, if you raise your hand, like you can talk more. Thank you. Um, when Maria mentioned this notion of uh, the uh, zoning subcommittee being um, irrelevant uh, an hour or so ago when we were talking about the priorities, uh, that's the idea that first came up there. One of the things that uh, Maria, you mentioned was the idea of the possibility that perhaps the, the uh, planning board should on a regular basis discuss these things. I would be certainly reason, I would be reasonable, it seems to me, and again, this is, I don't want to get ahead of this. Uh, it would seem to be reasonable if we're going to abolish the, the zoning subcommittee that we put a, a, an assumed hour in every planning board meeting to talk about zoning issues as as one of you know as as number seven right after new business or something like that i'm someplace in there that that becomes a regular uh point now maybe we're, we, we would just be responding to things that uh that this would bring us maybe we, we would be talking about these priorities that we've been talking about for much of the evening but uh we get so bogged down in in reviews one sort or another that we seldom have a chance to talk about the thing that I think the planning board is most appropriately the, the venue for, which is planning, zoning, protecting. Yep. So if we abolish the notion of the planning board having anything to do with zoning and give it to the planning department and give it to Mr. Mora and give it to the CRC, then what are we doing here? We're supposed to be doing zoning. And if we don't do it through a subcommittee, we've got to do it through the whole body. And I'm happy to do it through the whole body. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Chris Bestrup. And then I see Maria's hand. So I just Can want we... to mention that um, Rob Mara and I are going to meet with the um, Community Resources Committee on September 15th. We're scheduled mm -hmm. for the day. Um, and we're going to be talking about how we're planning to approach um, the rewrite of the zoning bylaw. And that will certainly bear on this discussion. Um, he and I are going to prepare a presentation and, um, you know, we, I can keep you up to date on what we're doing at our next planning board meeting on the 19th. We haven't gotten uh, a lot down on paper yet, um, but we're working on it. And um, so I think it'll be enlightening to talk about it on the 19th and to talk about it on the 15th of September, if you wanted to um, attend or listen in to the PRC meeting, which I think is going to be at two o'clock in the morning. Thank you for, and uh, Janet, I'll recognize you next and then Maria, but uh, Chris, that sounds good. Could you say that date again for us? September 15th, which I think is a Tuesday, is that right? Um, uh, probably a Tuesday. So, um, Great. Meeting virtually with us Tuesdays. Okay, and you will have a list of priorities from the planning board, and you'll have your own, and this is sort of a meeting of the minds, and that's good to hear. Thank you. Um, Janet. So, you know, this is something I've been thinking about for a while, which is, you know, especially since we're going to have new members, is maybe talking, a, like having a day retreat or something like, a, you know, a, a morning, a few hours or an afternoon on a weekend to talk about how we want to organize ourselves and focus on. Um, you know, because everyone, you know, throughout the year, people have all made suggestions, like Jack Jemsek was looking for, you know, like, how to, you know, in town, how do we get more land for, you know, research parts? Um, Doug Marshall has a thing with the whole construction, you know, how, why we have to read that aloud. Um, we can also, I think, talk about how we operate as a board and maybe the zoning subcommittee, the master plan implementation committee reorganizing our meetings a little more to focus on planning because it doesn't it seems to be our weak point um and you know maybe even just the process of how we go through every two week and stuff so it might be time for like a board retreat with some new members to kind of figure out how to move ahead you know working with the zoning updates and things like that so that's just a suggestion we've been thinking about for a while so anyway that's it thank you um i just want to remind everyone about the zoning subcommittee that um the planning board creates it, dissolves it, it can be recreated. So as things evolve over the next year or two, or, you know, and it could 
come back in a different capacity. And also the, the MPIC will also hopefully be developed over the next year. And I think that will be more comprehensive than just planning board members, but there might be one or two planning board members who, so that might get added to our list of planning board committees and liaisons. So um, keep that in mind. Um, Maria? Um, I just want to say that uh, I'd actually emailed Chris Brestrup June 4th <laughs> about the zoning subcommittee's usefulness and whether we could, you know, of course we, that was right. We were not meeting and, uh, and I thought, is it even worth starting up meeting again? And then I said, is it even worth existing? And so we had a brief <laughs> phone call. So I just want to apologize to you, Janet, about like being in the dark about it. It was something that I had been thinking about for a while. I didn't realize it was that long ago. And that I just really thought with so many moving parts, so many cogs in the machine all going to the same goal, it just didn't make sense to have the two of us, Christine Lee, you know, sitting around discussing inclusionary zoning and housing as much as I'd like to. It's something that wouldn't really result in anything. And it's a huge load on the planning department. I just keep, you know, emphasizing that as well. Yeah. So we don't have a big decision tonight. We're certainly not going to be meeting for a while, so it's not urgent, but it's sort of the general direction that um, I think we're heading toward. And like Christine said, if it needs to come back, it can come back later. But um, anyways, yeah, I just dug up my email. It was from like June 4th. It was like, I just had this bug in my ear, like, you know, this doesn't seem like a thing we really need anymore. So, um, but yeah, Janet, I... I, I didn't think of it as something I needed to talk to everyone about at that time. So I, I think just, if we had been meeting, it would have come up, but we don't meet. Yeah, so. I just I just sort of talked to Chris Brestrup about it. And, um, you know, it was in my head. <laughs> yeah. As it was mine, too. And I've talked to Chris Brestrup about it, mostly because of staff resources. And yeah, at this time, if, if anyone's up. noticed lately, I've been really, really fighting to try to get some stuff off Chris's plate and and, you know, be able to have her focus on what we really want her to focus on for us. So, um, uh, Chris, I would like to uh, recommend that you put this on the next planning board okay. meeting on the 19th. I think that gives everybody enough time to think about it and um, we're able to bring it up again then. Um, so with that said, I think we're done with the uh, committee and liaison reports. That was a lot, but we're kind of doing some housekeeping here that we haven't done in a long time and need to do. We're in a time of transition. So I'm gonna to move to item um, 10, report of chair, which um, a little sad to say, I wanna thank everybody for um, this past year has, uh, it's been crazy. It was a really good learning experience for me. Um, I really loved working with you all. I think we did an incredible amount of work. And we even have really mastered doing this through COVID online, pros and cons with both um, person and being here. But my term runs out at the end of this month. So um, with that, uh, we need to get new leadership. Um, I did talk to uh, Jack and we, uh, I think we would both, if he'll accept, we we would like to nominate um, Doug Marshall to replace me as chair. Um, and we can open this up to discussion. First, he has to even say he'd entertain the idea. <laughs> but I think you would be great. You've really hit the ground running, even though you're our youngest member. Um, are we doing nominations now or deciding um, now? Well, you have to have a chair and I won't be here. So, um, okay. I, I mean, so I, I mean, is, is this, is this normally an agenda item? I'm, I'm kind of lost. No, um, sometimes not always because people leave. It's been done all different ways over the past five years that I've been on the board. You could nominate Doug as a as a chair until you have elections. Um, I think what you probably want to do is wait until you have your new members um, to have an election. So Doug could be nominated as the interim chair until mm -hmm. you get your new members for formal elections. The elections are usually put on an agenda 
it is a formal agenda item. That would be my advice. Well, we can do it that way. Doug, would you um, accept? I, I'm just asked, finishing the question, Michael, and then would would you accept a um, to be interim chair, and then elections would be held when um, the new members uh, are brought on in September? Yeah, yeah, I'd be willing. Um, sure. I'm 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 going to be out of town on the 19th. Yeah. Oh. So we would do it in. Um, so, you know, I, I I hope to call in. I I know I have Wi-Fi where I'll be, but I I can't guarantee that I'll be available at the next meeting. And we still have a vice chair for that, or we will. Okay. Um. So, Michael. Uh. Am I? Yeah, I am. Um. Are you saying that you're not going to be the chair at the next meeting, at the next two meetings that you're you're leaving right now? There's only one more meeting, and I'm not sure I can make the 19th. Okay, we have a vice chair. We we do, but and I'm pitching seems, that I would it, like. It seems to me totally out of out of uh, out of order to uh, appoint a new chair. When we know that we're going to have at least two more, two new members of the board, maybe three, uh, coming on w in September, uh, and we have a f perfectly fine functioning vice chair to operate until such a, such time as we have a full board to elect a new chair. So I think we, we could, but what I just asked is if Doug would be interim chair. I understand what you have. I don't mind. What I'm saying is, we don't need an interim chair. We have a vice chair right now. So we we could, but my concern is we are in COVID, and the CRC has has not done this before, and if it could be a while before we could have new members in September, or it could take longer. So well, we have a we have a, a meeting scheduled. For interviews uh, at the end of, at the end of August. Yes, but it's we've been here before and it didn't happen. So I I'm just remembering. Uh, I, I past, don't so. think you've been here before and it didn't happen. I think the last time that last time there were interviews, Doug was uh, appointed almost immediately thereafter. That's that's the most. Now this was supposed to happen by June thirtieth, and it well, didn't. I know happen. that, but there weren't any there weren't any interviews scheduled. There was not a, a pool. Okay. The, there was not a pool that was deemed adequate. There is now a pool. Okay. 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 Are, okay. okay. You're not done, Christine. There <laughs> are uh, there are uh, uh, interviews scheduled, and the CRC is immediately going to recommend to the council whoever they recommend, and those people will be seated if not at the first meeting in September, certainly at the second meeting in September. And it seems to me inappropriate for us six people to determine who the chair is going to be when at least two of us won't be there, and maybe three of us won't be there. Okay, so just to put in perspective, I've been a new member on a committee when they do elections, and it's how it, they don't necessarily know how to vote because they don't know us. They don't know who has, is, wants it, who, who's good at what. Yeah. And so often I didn't even vote because I had no perspective on how to make such a decision. And I relinquished the decision to the veteran members who knew far better than I what would be best for moving forward as leadership. Well, that's clearly was your choice and a reasonable one. but. Uh, and but I'm just other, other people coming onto the board may not have that point of view. They may think they know what they're doing and may want to vote for somebody. And maybe well, they'll be right. Let me remind you that elections are supposed to be done by June 30th of every year. So by the time these people come on, we're already two months into that year. We're behind. So this should have been done back in June, but it wasn't because of various things. Um, so what I'm saying is they will be voting, but there's only 10 months left at that point. And then you're supposed to re-vote every year. So we're already- This doesn't seem like a big set of problems to me. 
why don't we just talk about this? You know, one thing, maybe we should reschedule the August okay. 15th meeting. Well, here's my thing. If this is my last meeting, I'm just looking at this as we can't push everything. Off. What is with this? Like next meeting, more talk. Like, look, this is, I proposed an interim chair because I'm stepping down. We can vote on it. If I hear a motion from someone, I'm going to, there's some raised hands. We can vote on it. And if, there's a, if it doesn't pass, it doesn't pass. So I'm just pitching. The I, I just, I just, I feel like the end. The, it feels like the end of this meeting is like a giant open meeting law violation. Why? I mean, why wasn't this on the agenda? Why didn't we know about this weeks? You know, Part it, of, I don't understand. If you, what's going on? The planning board rules and regulations. It very clearly says we're supposed to do this every year by the end of the fiscal, the end of June thirtieth. It's what we're yes, supposed to and, do. There's nothing so we, in the rules. So, so this problem has been known about for months, and now we're talking about it at 10 o'clock at night at the end of a meeting with no notice. Let's because things are never... And talk about it. Like, well, yeah, the vice chair can do the next meeting. You knew I was leaving, so this is I had no idea you weren't going to be here next week. If, if I wasn't going to be... It doesn't matter. It, I'd still be doing this, even if I had one more meeting left. This is... <sighs> The end. I'm leaving. We all knew I was leaving. So we should have all been thinking about who should replace me. And, you know, Jack is the norm that you default to, but he has a very heavy workload. So he doesn't want to. So he'd rather stay as vice chair, which is fine. And so my thinking after a lot of thought, I just, I wanted to put out there as we're allowed to do. I'm just pitching that Forget inter. I mean, I, I asked if Doug Marshall would want to be chair. So normally, I know, Janet, you're only been on the board for a year, but when this happened last year, then we talk about it and, you know, other people can volunteer too and we can have multiple votes, but this is what happens every year. I'm on my fifth year. This happens every year. Well, why don't we appoint Michael because he's been there for four years and knows how to run a planning board meeting and can cover for a few weeks or a month. I, it just seems very, I just, I don't know why we're talking about this without, you know, just, but I just, let's take somebody who's been around for a while, gone to maybe too many planning board meetings and just have him run the show for a month or so, you know, next month. And we'll notice the vote and we'll, people will know it is and we'll think about it. And it seems very on the fly. Well, I've given my recommendation. I'm going to call on some other hands. Janet, I know you can't raise a hand, but I like, can't. I'm not trying to have a dialogue with you. You have to either say I'd like to speak and then I'll put you in the queue. Okay. That's good. So, idea. Um, and, you know, okay. Maria? <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I forget what the name of my term is secretary. I don't know what I am. But, yeah, anyways. I don't have the capacity both mentally and time-wise to be chair and I fully support Doug. Doug is a planner and architect and knows this stuff. Um, he's the newest member but he knows what we're talking about very fully and I just, I, I, the fact that he was willing to even take it, um, you know, to step up, I really appreciate it. And I think that, um, you know, there might be other people who want to do it or, or have time to. I, I certainly can't. <laughs> um, I don't know, Jack, what your situation is, but um, yeah, it's just, I think Jack was, I don't know all the proper terms, but number two, and then I was number three. And so that's just the way the, the things sort of run around. And um, yeah, I don't know if, Chris, you know, like what the protocol is, if if both the second and third in chain can't really um step up, step up, step up. you know what you what your official steps should have been but um i fully support doug so jack yeah it looks like we lost janet she's still listed over here in attendees that's what i just went looking for janet can are you there I can hear you, but I can't see me, which, you know, might be just fine. That's I, because you're on a telephone now, right? No, I hung, I hung up, I, I, I moved my 
my um, computer and I'm in a different room now. Oh, okay. I see your name. You just haven't turned on your screen. Yeah, we'll figure that out. But anyway. Oh, okay, Jack, I believe you were speaking. Yeah, so I just want to say, I mean, obviously, Christine and I have talked not violating open meeting law probably, you know, six months ago, <laughs> a while. And I, you know, and you grind along, you know, in life. And uh, where I'm at right now is, you know, I have a new job, started that in February. It's it's great. But I'm, uh, and I also have some other commitments, some which I'm pulling out of. And then this Pioneer Valley Planning Commission thing, I want to take very seriously. That meets, you know, monthly in addition to the, you know, quarterly meetings for the commissioners. And so that weighed on my mind. And then also like, man, you know, Christine has done just an amazing job as the chair. <laughs> it's like, I was like, holy cow, how can I, you know? And so I, I have all these expectations of myself of like, if I was to be chair and, and do it, you know, to the best of my ability. And, and, and so, and that's, that's where I was uh, cautionary and I, you know, and Christine had that information, you know, and Marie has already, you know, said her case and, and, uh, and I, I just have to say that, um, you know, no disrespect to, to Mike, we, you know, but uh, Doug has, he, he, he's been pretty, um, for me, uh, impressive in terms of, I, I don't know that, for me, I was like on the board for like a year. Uh, <laughs> it's like, you know, what's all this about? And I think the first meeting, uh, Doug was like, he didn't skip a beat. And so I was just very impressed by him. And then he's a planner. Um, and and uh, Christine said that he was interested. So I, I support, you know, Doug, if uh, he can do it, whether it's interim, um, whatever I, but I, I have, we we would be in good hands with, with Doug. Uh, I have no doubt. Uh, and that's, you know, that's how I have looked at, but I have really been struggling. I've, I've been struggling with this because I knew Christine was leaving. I'm the vice chair. I know I could do it, but I, I want to do it really well. And, um, you know, I just question that, you know, now's the right time in my life to take to take that on and um and you know again i i i apologize to to you know oh janet you're 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 back on video <laughs> but but anyway it was it's been all on me and i maybe this you know i don't know how you get dialogue on something like this but it's just um it was personal to me um but Christine had a, you know, uh, a suggestion of Doug, and I think it, it, you know, it's a good one. It's a good one. So, um, and that's, you know, that's where I'm at, you know, on this. But I understand Mike and Janet. This is it's ten o'clock and it's tough. But I don't want Christine to leave. I mean, that's my choice right there. So, what do you do? <laughs> Well, I would like, to, I would feel better leaving with at least an interim chair. Um, I think it shows leadership and camaraderie amongst ourselves. I think Doug is, we're so lucky to have him. Um, he's really proved his worth um, in the eight months or, that we've had him. Um, You know, I, I would like to, um, well, I see Chris's hand. Um, Chris? Well, I just wanted to talk about the way this is traditionally done. So traditionally, the um, people get appointed, I mean, ideally, to the planning board in June. Um, they get appointed in June, and they take office at the beginning of July. So traditionally, we wait until people are appointed. And as I said, it's an ideal scenario because often you don't actually get appointments until September. But in my experience, um, the, the elections are usually put on the agenda as an, as, as an item, and they're usually um, put on the agenda after the new members um, take office. 
So my recommendation, as I said before, would be to put it on the agenda for one of the September meetings after um, you get your new members and um, hold formal elections at that time and to elect an interim chair at this time to carry you through until you have your formal elections. And you would have to do that anyway. If you got to a meeting, say you got to the meeting on the 19th of August and nobody, uh, and neither Maria nor Jack wanted to chair, you would have to elect uh, a chairperson for that particular meeting. So one way or another, you're going to have an interim chair until you have your elections. So this seems like a reasonable thing to do to elect an interim chair tonight. That's what I would like to do. Um, Janet, I see your hand. And then Michael, I think you're raising your hand. So I don't want to be um, anti-Doug in any way, because I think he's been a great add to the planning board also. I don't think we can vote on something this is a violation of open meeting law to be voting on an interim chair or any kind of vote without notice. This is obviously could be seen under, you know, it could have been, it's not something that came up suddenly. I assumed Christine was going to be our chair until the end of August. If we show up at the next planning board meeting and nobody wants to be chair, the vice chair doesn't want to be chair, the secretary wasn't going to be chair, let's appoint that person in. I, I'm not comfortable voting. I'm not voting against Doug in any way. Um, but I just not comfortable voting without an, an item that's never been on the agenda that was, you know, beyond, I hate to use a legal term foreseeable, but it's, I don't know how we got here and I'm, I'm not going to be voting on anybody or anything. So I think that's an open meeting law violation. Michael. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not focused on the question whether it's an open, open meeting law violation. I, I don't know about that. Uh, but that's not, that's not what, I'm, what I'm interested in. Uh, it, it's it, the responsibility of the vice chair is to serve in the absence of the chair. If Christine Gray Mullen is not going to be here on August 19th, it's Jack's duty, <laughs> if you will, to chair the meeting. Uh, we don't need an interim chair. That's what the that's what the vice chair is for. Now, Jack agreed to be vice chair. Vice chair fills I'm, in for the ago. chair. I'm not finished. I'm not finished, Christine. Okay. Just saying, Jack, you agreed to be vice chair a year ago, or whenever it was. Um, it seems to me that uh, you should continue to be vice chair and serve as chair in the absence of the chair uh, as, as, as long as you're a member of the board. I just don't think we need to have this kind of... Uh, uh, decision being made at this point. We don't need a vice, we don't need an interim chair. We have a vice chair. So that no, you'll have no chair. So what a vice chair does is it fills in for the chair, but there won't be any chair. You're supposed to have a chair. That's a that's a that's a, Look, a here's my thing. We're voting on an interim chair. I, I don't see the problem with that. Well, the problem with that, with all due respect to Doug, is the interim chair is then the de facto chair when it comes time to electing a permanent chair. So is it that you want to be chair, Michael? No, I don't want to be chair. It's the last thing I want to do because then, my, my only real function in this body is to be a, a, a goad. I'm not the chair. I, I, that's not my function. That's not my role. I don't want to be chair. Okay, Janet, do you want to be chair? I'm sorry, you're muted. I, don't, I, I feel like we've gone from talking about getting rid of the zoning subcommittee to voting on an interim chair, and you know, I don't see no, any I'm of talking about chair, chair, full chair. Do I want to be chair? I, I'd like to think about it more than 20 seconds. I, I, I don't know. Is this normal process? Is this no, why can't we just wait till real. I'm just tossing it out that if Jack's not up. For being chair and neither is Maria and I'm gone and Michael doesn't want to be chair Doug has said he's willing to be chair there's only you like so there's only two options so I don't understand what it makes a difference if it's September or if it's now there's I, one or maybe two people who would want to be chair well I'm an attorney there's an open meeting law there's no open meeting law with this Janet you don't have to 
publish an interim chair. Okay, I'm just not supporting what we're doing here. I just don't understand this. This is just very strange, Christine. I just don't understand it. I'm leaving. I've been trying to leave for a year and four months. But everybody can proceed and vote. I'm just, I'm not going to vote on this. I just think this is really irregular and it's hard for me to understand. And I, I know you think this is really an odd position, but I don't think it, you understand how odd it is to have someone at 10, 15 at night say, do you want to be chair? We need a chair. You know, I'm leaving. I, I just think this is just- Everybody knew I was leaving. I, I don't know what the mystery is here. There had to be a new chair. It should have happened in June. We're in August. Everybody knew I was leaving. So something was gonna have to happen. So this is where everyone should have been thinking, how do we see this moving forward? And normally it goes to the vice chair or the secretary, but that's not happening in this instance. So I think Doug Marshall would be a fantastic interim chair right now and have your elections in the fall with your two or three new members. That's what I'm pitching. I, I don't think there's anything outrageous. There's only five of us. Um, I mean, there's six of us, I'm counting me, <laughs> but, um, and it, it just, in case something happens and things don't roll out the way, you know, we're in COVID, we have no idea. It, so I'm sort of living life right now. If we can do it today and just make some action and, and keep leadership and keep things moving forward, let's seize the day. And, and this is, it, it's just an interim. It, so anyways, I, I would, and, and I feel terrible for Doug. This is so awko, like what the heck? Like we're just trying to get a temporary chair to be able to work with Chris, like to keep things moving forward. This just seems so destructive to me to not even want to vote for an interim chair. It, it, what else does there need to be think thought about for two more weeks or a month or six weeks? We're just trying to do an interim chair. If we can do elections in September, fantastic. But it may not happen. It may be October or November. We live in very strange times right now. So as chair, I was just trying to leave you all in good hands. And I couldn't think of a better set of hands than Doug Marshall to lead the way. He has shown nothing but exemplary leadership and knowledge and shocking, I know he's gonna be all embarrassed now, how fast he came up to speed. And I, I, I am gonna say, I think he knows more than, than all of us. So, except for not you, Chris. <laughs> so anyways, I strongly would like to have a vote to vote Doug Marshall to be our interim chair. This is, Literally what I am asking you, I, I have given myself <laughs> as much as I could this past year and the five years on the board. And this is the last thing I'm just asking that don't leave yourself without a leader. We have an amazing person here who's willing to step in as the interim chair. And I'm asking you to please consider. I see Janet, then Jack, then Chris. Janet, you're, you're muted again. I had a vestigial hand up, sorry. Okay, um, Jack? Yeah, I just, I, I, I just wanna say that I would support Doug, but you know, I have no problem being you know, the intern person, but in my mind, uh, knowing that Doug is interested, you know, he would be my vote, but I don't mind being, uh, you know, in this transitional role being, you know, doing that and, you know, a couple of meetings, but, you know, that's, uh, I, I feel discord here and, uh, I, you know, I don't like that feeling within the board. Um, so, um, I know I would support Doug once we have, the chair uh, come up full, but if, you know, I'd be willing to chair the next couple of sessions as a bridge and then, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd nominate Doug, um, but 
but is that a difference than just non nominating him now? So I, um, you know, I feel, <laughs> yeah, a sense of duty, uh, but I, 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 you know, I'm hearing what, you know, I get, I guess I'm interested in what, what Chris, feel, you know, feels is correct. I mean, like, I think Christina said, like, there's no, it's all over the place in terms of how things are done in this situation. And yeah, you know, should have been on the agenda perhaps, but I mean, I didn't even really know, uh, you know, today was, I, I didn't even know Dave actually left, you know, last meeting. <laughs> And then he's in the he's in the you know the in the participants there. It's like wait a minute, did we forget yeah. to add? So, but anyway, I um, I just want to do the right thing, and um, everyone knows my my intentions, what my desire are, and you know, and um, just want to do the right thing here. And I think we need your help, Chris, to make sure we're doing the right thing. Chris. So I would be comfortable with having Jack serve as interim chair between now and the time you have your elections. Um, an alternative would be to actually put an interim election on the agenda for August 19th, but you would only have five members available to vote. So um, it seems to me that the best scenario in my mind would be to have Jack chair the next couple of meetings and then schedule your election for um, September when you have your full complement of members. That would be my advice. Michael. I'd like to hear what uh, Doug has to say. Everybody else has been shooting their mouth off. Well, let's put Doug in an even harder spot now. Doug. Now I'm unmuted. Oh, right. Yes, you are. Okay. Um, so I wasn't really looking to become chair, especially as fast as this would be. Uh, Christine's compliments notwithstanding, I don't feel like I know everything about Amherst zoning. Neither and, do I. <laughs> and I'm, a, I'm, I'm rather afraid that if I were chair, I would display that ignorance uh, more often than I've been able to so far. Um, I actually agree that this is awkward. Uh, and I think um, my feeling at the moment is that if Jack is willing to act as the bridge, uh, you know, with, and we all need to keep in mind that he's not really able to give it the time or attention that I think he would like to, that we then, you know, commit to having an, uh, some sort of uh, election, you know, with or without me in the mix um, in, it's a, in September, you know, and, and I, I don't know how certain it is that we will get our new members, but you know, it seems like even if there's only five of us who need to go along for a couple months, it doesn't seem like Jack really wants to be that in that the leader for very long. Mm -hmm. So, so I at the moment I would sort of second what Chris is suggesting, which is that we uh, ask Jack to 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 help us forward and and try to minimize the load he has to carry during that time. Well said, Doug. Nice leadership. I, um, I have to say I'm disappointed. I think we have something really great that we're walking away from, and I hope we don't regret it. I hope we do have members in September, and I'd like to clarify that today, that if we don't, what if we only have one, or we only have two, or maybe we do have all three. Now you're talking about three out of seven people that haven't even ever been to a meeting before. And that's a lot of pressure to put 
them right in the election to choose their leader. Um, and I, I'm just saying we, we could have set a tone here with an interim, but I don't understand why when you actually, whether it's a surprise or not, it shouldn't have been a surprise. And when we look to who we have, when we look at this, I'm gone. So we look to the five, who's your leader? Who's going to lead you? So, you know, part of being on planning board is you have to make decisions. You have to take action. And I, I don't think we took action today. I think we just made a really awkward moment and made someone who should be, I think, our leader. We, we gave him not a welcoming feeling. This was not teamwork. So I have to say I'm very disappointed and I'm really sad that this is how I'm ending my year as chair. But <sighs> Janet, I see your hand. Janet, you're muted. Um, in a bid to avoid a vote, can, can Jack just act as vice chair and haul on a couple of meetings and then um, we don't have to vote and Jack will just be the vice chair taking over temporarily until we get a, you know, on the agenda and make a vote and all that good stuff. Is I that possible? Good, yeah. I think but, but we don't know when that will happen because yeah. if it's, if but we I don't mean, have new members in the beginning of September, then you only have five members, so you're I shrinking. We, I think we can handle that situation, but at least we know we're we'll heading into it. But Christine, I do appreciate all the work it takes to be a chair, and I, don't, I hope it doesn't end on a really sour note. I just, you know, if Jack can step up as vice chair for one or two meetings, that's fantastic. But, you know, I know you put a huge amount of effort into this, and I, I wouldn't want to end it on this note either. So, I know, I mean, this takes hours and hours and hours, and just even reading those insane site, you know, those documents, I just, it's kind of just, you've done a really, you know, good job. So thank you. Thank you. Chris. I don't think you have to have an election to have Jack serve as chair because he's the vice chair. So if Christine's not here, then Jack would be the normal person who would step into that role. So there's really no need for an election um, at this time. And in September, when you have your election scheduled, then you would um, choose your chair and your vice chair and your clerk at that time. So, adios, hasta la vista. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Well, report of staff. Chris, do you uh, got anything? Uh, okay. I wanted to say thank you to Christine for all her hard work. Yay, Christine. Helping me. team. We're we a team. team. <laughs> We've been a good team. And thank you very much, Christine. And I wish you great luck and happiness in your new endeavors. Madame, <laughs> Madame Chair. Madam she has, Chair. Uh, you know, <laughs> made such a, a big impression uh, on me and, and her dedication. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah. not, not, it, she, she put the bar pretty high. Pretty you know, high. I've seen Steve Schreiber uh, uh, and Greg Stutzman. Um, and I know that Christine worked hand in hand with you, Chris, uh, above and beyond the call of duty, just because you've gotten waylaid with the change in government yep. and everything else on your docket and um but again um don't be disappointed christine you've <laughs> Sorry, been a huge uh, success it's, it's and and, and doug i think doug's cool i think doug's <laughs> yes. cool. doug is very cool all right all right I, so christine, I, I apologize <laughs> to doug for for this and i have great hope that it'll all work out um and thank you all Thank you all for working so hard. I want to thank Pam. Pam, you are fantastic. You are like the wind beneath this whole thing. Yes. Aww. Seriously, thank you. <laughs> and it's been a pleasure. The amount of work that you have to do and the amount of stuff and things you're juggling, it is amazing. And please pace yourself, take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to a lot of great things happening this next year. Mm -hmm. 
Bye, Bye everyone. Mom. Bye. Hope we Wait, are we adjourned? 1029? Yep. 1029.